Chapter One Apollo. It has become the Englishman's habit, one might almost say the Englishman's instinct, to take himself for the head and front of the universe. The order of creation began, we are told, in protoplasm. It has achieved at length the Englishman. Herein are the culmination and ultimate glory of evolutionary processes. Nature, like the seventh standard boy in a board school, can get no higher. She has made the Englishman, and her work therefore is done. For the continued progress of the world and all that is in it, the Englishman will make due provision. He knows exactly what is wanted, and by himself it shall be supplied. There is little that can be considered distinguishingly English which does not reflect this point of view. As an easy-going, entirely confident, imperturbable piece of arrogance, the Englishman has certainly no mammalian compere. Even in the blackest of his troubles he perceives that he is great. I shall muddle through, he says. He is expected and understood to muddle through, and muddle through or not, he invariably believes he has done it. Sheer complacency bolsters him up on every hand. At his going forth, the rest of the world is fain to abase itself in the dust. He is the strong man, the white man of white men. He is the rich, clean sportsman, the incomparable, the fearless, the intolerable. And by Englishmen, the world has learned not to mean Britain. The world has been taught to discriminate. It has regarded the Britannic Brotherhood, and though it forgets that the Gale and the Celt are Britons, it takes its Englishman for a Briton only with a difference. On the other hand, it is keenly sensible of sundry facts, as that it is the Englishman who rules the waves, and the Englishman upon whose dominions the sun never sets that the british flag is the english flag the british army the english army and the british navy the english navy and that scotland and ireland with wales are english appanages it would be foolish to assert that the englishman has greatly concerned himself in either the promulgation or the acceptance of these notions but he holds them dear and they are ineradicably planted in his subconsciousness one is inclined to think however that while the supremacy and superiority of the englishman have been received without traverse in his own dominions there are those in outer darkness on the continent in ireland and even in scotland who admit no such supremacy and no such superiority nay there are persons breathing the breath of life who so far from looking upon the englishman with the eyes with which the early savage must have regarded captain cook look upon him with the eyes with which captain cook regarded the early savage in ireland particularly hatred of the english has become a deep-grounded national characteristic the french dislike of perfidious albion may be reckoned to a great extent an intermittent matter it sputters and flares when a fashoda or a boer war comes along and it has a way of finding its deadliest expression in caricature but the irish hatred is as persistent and concrete as it is ancient in scotland the feeling about the english amounts in the main to good-humoured tolerance touched with a certain amazement the least cultivated of scotsmen and such a man is quite a different being from the least cultivated of englishmen will tell you that the english are chiefly notable by reason of their profound ignorance and a ridiculous passion for the dissipation of money the scot of the middle class thinks his neighbour is a feckless foolish person who would pass muster if he could be serious and has got what he possesses by good luck rather than by good management up to a point both are right for the english in the mass are at once much more ignorant and much less thrifty than the people of scotland and their good nature and happy-go-luckiness are things to set a scot moralizing years ago matthew arnold put the right names on the two more creditable and powerful sections of english society the aristocracy he set down for barbarians the middle class for philistines 
the aristocracy were inaccessible to ideas he said the middle class admired and loved the aristocracy it is so to this day and so to an extent which is in entire consonance with the circumstance that for sheer stupidity the englishman of the upper class is without parallel while the englishman of the middle class cannot be paralleled for snobbishness arnold's complaint that neither class was a reading class or at all devoted to the higher matters still holds the great broad-shouldered genial englishman whom tennyson sang and at whom arnold jibed is still with us that he is as great and as broad-shouldered and as genial as ever nobody will deny and broadly speaking his outlook upon life remains exactly what it was to be ruddy and healthy to go out mornings with dogs to dine hilariously and dance evenings to be generous to the poor and to honour oneself and the king are the rule of his life if he be a barbarian and to ape these things and consider them gifts of price if he be a philistine since arnold however the englishman egregious though he undoubtedly was has taken unto himself a new and altogether alarming demerit out of his love of health and ease and security and pleasure and well-ordered materialism there has sprung up a trouble which is like to cost him exceeding dear a trouble in fact which if he be not careful will go far to emasculate him if not wholly to destroy him of the higher matters as has been said he has taken but the smallest heed writer fellows uh, painter fellows philosopher johnnies and so forth are not of his world except in so far as they may entertain his womenfolk or deck his halls with commercial canvas or assist him in the eking out of his small talk before dessert it is not to be expected of him that he should take to his heart persons whom he cannot by any possibility understand even arnold could forgive him that failing it was the build of the man the breed and constitution of him that justified him but since being english he has found his way to the unpardonable sin it was well that he should despise persons who however much they might think did little and got little for doing it it was well that brains which could not sit a horse and preferred bed to the moors and had no rent-roll should be despised it would have been well too if that other kind of brains which beginning with nothing ends in millionairedom and flagrant barbarianism might also have continued to be despised and to be kept at arm's length the great broad-shouldered genial englishman however has succumbed park lane has become a ghetto my lord's house parties reek of gentlemen with noses and names ending in baum and the english houses of parliament the finest club in europe the mother of parliaments the most dignified assemblage under the sun is just a branch of the stock exchange as the exceedingly clever young man who recently wrote a book about the scot might say this shows what the english really are it has been remarked and possibly not without truth that the scot keeps the sabbath and everything else he can lay his hands upon he is credited with being the perfect money-grubber his desire for competence we have been told by the clever young man before mentioned has blighted his soul and brought him into opprobrium among turks and chinamen well the scot does look after money he desires competence he loves independence and when he can get them ease and pleasure are gratifying to him if he comes off the rock and attains affluence he is not averse to the goodnesses that affluence commands he will start a castle and a carriage and a coat of arms with the best of them he will lift up his family and leave his children well provided for in these connections he is just as human as the next man but he never has played and he never will play the english game of lavishness and wastefulness and swaggering profusion and least of all will he play it on a 
a basis of undesirable association the scotsman who has compassed wealth even though he be the son of a mole-catcher or a sweetie wife or a glasgow beer-seller can always remember that there is such a thing as spiritual integrity and though he may or may not boo and boo and boo in accordance with the good old kindly english legend he certainly will not do it in jews houses this i take it is where he has some little advantage over englishmen perhaps no finer indication of the english spirit and of the greed and corruption that have overtaken it could have been offered than has been offered by the trend of recent events in south africa to go thoroughly over the ground in such an essay as the present is of course impossible to state the arguments for both sides would be to reproduce writing of which everybody is heartily tired the battling newspapers have said their say and we are just beginning to feel the comfort of a more or less reasonable settlement all that need be said here is that the englishman has not come out of this war with anything like the honour and the glory and the eclat that he has been accustomed to expect of himself in similar undertakings his bodily prowess his hardihood his spartan capacity for withstanding the rigours of campaigning his military abilities and his very patriotism have all had to be called in question during the past two and a half years when he went out to the fray his cry was ha ha and the war was to be over in six weeks he had the finest equipment the finest munitions the finest men the finest system the world had seen he was as fit as a fiddle and as hard as nails and his love of music prompted him to take a piano with him then the english and they that dwell in outer darkness saw many things they have been learning their lesson ever since they have learned that in a fight the great broad-shouldered genial englishman instead of being worth three frenchmen is worth about the fiftieth part of a boer farmer they have learned that the great broad-shouldered genial englishman is not above selling spavined horses and stinking beef to the country that he loves and they have learned that when a great broad-shouldered genial englishman is discovered in his incompetence or his culpable negligence or his dishonour it is the business of all the other great broad-shouldered genial englishmen to get round him and screen him from the public gaze and swear that he is a maligned and misunderstood man the incidents of the war alone without any backing or the smallest distortion or exaggeration have been quite sufficient to show that there is something rotten in the condition of the english it has been a tale of shame and ignominy and disaster from beginning to end it has resulted in a peace which practically settles very little and an inquiry with closed doors verily apollo must have a care for his reputation in the pantheon End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 The Sportsman The Englishman who is not a sportsman dares not mention the circumstance. In the counties he must shoot and hunt or be forever damned. In the towns he must have daily dealings with a starting-price bookmaker and hourly news from the racecourses and the cricket patches. Otherwise Englishmen decline to know him. I am a sportsman, sir, is the English shibboleth it is the english love of manly sports that has made the english paramount in every land and in every sea the lord chief justice of england rode stroke for his college in oxford versus cambridge in eighteen fifteen otherwise he would not be lord chief justice of england at eighteen the lord chancellor was one of the best sprinters of his day otherwise he would never have dandled his little legs on the woolsack sir henry campbell bannerman is a keen shot and was one of a party of seven who made the biggest bag on record in eighteen sixty five otherwise he would never have been leader of the opposition mr henry labouchere is one of our most brilliant and daring steeplechase riders otherwise he would never have owned truth mrs ormiston chant is a cricket enthusiast so are the archbishop of canterbury mr joseph chamberlain and mr tommy bowles lord roberts can take a hand at croquet with the best young woman out of girton and mr john morley understands a racehorse almost as well as he understands the encyclopedist in fact the english eminent are either sportsmen or nothing and all the other english follow suit 
now and again somebody gets up and points out that betting is a great evil whereupon the duke of devonshire opens one eye and says that he never had a shilling on a horse in his life then everybody says that horse racing is good for the breed of horses employing large amounts of capital and large numbers of honest persons and on the whole a manly and profitable pastime incidentally too it transpires that fox hunting is an equally noble and english form of sport and that when farmers cease from puppy walking britain may very well drop the epithet great from her name or perhaps mr kipling fresh from the unpleasant truths of south africa conceives a distich or two as to flannelled fools and muddied oafs in response there is an immediate and emphatic english howl why cannot the little man stick to his recessionals how dare he call sportsmen like ranji and trot and bloggs and biffkin flannelled fools much less the tottenham hotspurs and sheffield united muddy oafs is it not true that the battle of waterloo was won on the playing fields of eton were not flannelled fools and muddied oafs among the first to throw up their home ties and fling themselves into the imminent breach when the war broke out are not cricket and football healthy and admirable old english sports and pleasantly calculated to keep the youth of the country out of much worse mischief on saturday afternoons and so on right down the line the english are sportsmen sport is bred in the bone of them less than a century ago they were cock-fighting and man-fighting in the splendid english way they would be doing it yet if their own stupid laws did not prevent them instead they race horses and pursue the fox watch cricket and football matches and play tennis and croquet and ping-pong it is sport that keeps england sweet if it were not for sport the english would cease to have red faces and husky voices and check suits one presumes too that if it were not for sport they would entirely lose their sense of fair play their love of honest dealing and that spirit of self-sacrifice which notoriously informs all their actions it is sport that has made the english the justest as well as the greatest of the nations it is sport which keeps her unspotted of the lower vices such as drunkenness indolence and misspent saturday afternoons it is sport which gives her a standard of manliness an all-day press and a platform upon which prince and pauper the highest and the lowest meet as common men long live sport perhaps it is pardonable in a scot to note that the only forms of sport which can be pronounced sane and devoid of offence came out of scotland the grand instance in point of course is the ancient and royal game of golf without attempting to say a word that would tend to exaggerate the value of a pastime which is beloved by all scotsmen and not without its appreciators even in england it seems fitting to remark that in golf you have a game which while every whit as healthy as manly and as invigorating as horse racing cricket football and the rest of them can never by any chance become the mere kill time of the idle unparticipating spectator or the prey of the professional the ready-made bookmaker and the halfpenny journal as to other scottish sports one need not here particularize but they are all healthy and honest in the broadest sense and with the single exception of football which has been corrupted by the english they have not been allowed to deteriorate into vices the exploitation of popular pastimes by covetous and unprincipled persons is an unmistakable sign of national decadence in england that exploitation goes on without let or hindrance and in almost every department protest brings merely contempt and objurgation upon the head of the protester and the national virility continues to be slowly but surely sapped away that the english notion of sport should permit of the orgies of bloodshed rowdyism and partisanship which takes place in the coverts and on football fields race-courses and cricket grounds serves to indicate that in spite of all that has been said and sung in its praises the english notion of sport is an exceedingly sad and sorry one 
it is natural that a people given over to display and the getting of money for the sake of the more unnecessary luxuries money can buy should in a great measure lose its taste for outdoor sports of the primal order the english are losing that taste at a rate which can leave no doubt as to the ultimate upshot in brief the englishman as sportsman worth the name seems to be disappearing and in his place england will have the adipose plethoric mechanical slayer of birds who goes to his shoot in a bath chair and the cadaverous undersized saturday afternoon zealot the chief joys of whose existence are the cracking of filberts and the kicking of umpires End of chapter two chapter three the man of business the english all the world has heard are a nation of shopkeepers they are understood to keep shop and to glory in it they have kept shop with the other nations for customers ever since international shopkeeping became a possibility in the beginning one is afraid their notion of shopkeeping ran neither to fair trade nor honest dealing but gradually there has built up a system of commercial equity the main principle of which was the protection of one shopkeeper against another and the security of shopkeepers generally in course of time the english man of business arose he had a silk hat and expansive manners he lived in a suburb and read the times on his way to business in the morning all day at his office he would cheat no man and his word was as good as his bond his office day was a day of quite ten hours and during those ten hours he sweated like the proverbial nigger at nights he retired to his suburb and with the wife and children whom he kept there ate to repletion from the joint washed it down with sherry and port supplied to him by merchants of the type of the late mr ruskin's father and hey presto by eleven of the clock he was deep among the feathers twice on sundays he went to church and held the plate to sunday's midday dinner he invited the vicar or a curate and there was always beef and batter pudding and improving talk not to mention cabbage and an extra special glass of wine sir other recreations the english man of business had none save and except perhaps an occasional saturday afternoon drive in a hired chaise with mrs man of business and the children and a still more occasional visit to the theatre in the long run by the practice of these virtues he amassed wealth he put his money into good bottoms he owed no man a penny and as he never robbed anybody and always lived miles within his income he had a conscience so easy that it seemed to sleep everybody respected him he was in demand to take the chair at the meetings of young men's improvement societies and to explain the secret of his success free gratis and for nothing to the callow young men thereat assembled he would tell you unctuously that he attributed his success one to early rising two to never wasting time the split infinitive was his three to always saving at least one-third of his income four to never going bond for anybody and five to marrying mrs man of business this last of course with a chortle so he wagged along and helped to build up the commercial greatness and probity and honour of his country and when he died he had a magnificent and costly funeral and was attended to his last long home by his weeping relict and sorrowing sons and daughters next day there was an account of mr man of business's obsequies in the local papers and his sons proceeded to carry on the concern that was forty years ago to-day the english man of business is a bird of an entirely different and altogether more entrancing feather indeed it is a question whether he has not ceased to be a man of business at all one might perhaps sum him up best by saying that he has begun to have notions whereas he was once the bulwark of the philistine class he has now gone over lock stock and barrel particularly barrel to the barbarians he lives in the manner style and odour of barbarism and the ruling ambition of his existence is to pass for a county magnet a man of birth and leisure rather than for a man of business so that he has entirely laid aside the characteristics which distinguished his early and middle victorian prototype 
breadth girth weight the substantial the ponderous are not for him he does not attribute his success to early rising he does not boast that his word is his bond he does not slap his sides when he laughs he never went to business on a tram-car in his life and as for his owing all he is to mrs man of business it is to his association with that charming beschiffened and bejeweled little lady that he owes all he owes in other words the new english man of business has made up his mind that if life is to be made tolerable at all it must be made tolerable through social ways that is to say if one's income runs to a couple of thousand a year out of a butter business one must live in precisely the manner of persons whose incomes run to two thousand a year out of lands and hereditaments the glass of fashion and the mould of form for a person who would live is mayfair lords and dukes and the landed gentry have houses in mayfair their wives and female relatives flutter round in flashing equipages and brilliant toilettes there is the theatre the opera and other people's houses in the evening the park on sundays the river in the summer scotland in the autumn and the riviera for the winter and early spring lords and dukes and the landed gentry tread this pretty round and find both pleasure and dignity in it why not the head of the old established firm of margarine sons brothers and company why not indeed old margarine founder of the house never missed a day at the office for forty years young margarine will tell you that after all you know it is rather amusing to drop into the office sometimes and see the fellows sit up all the same the business is a beastly bore and there are moments when he wishes it at the deuce as for mrs margarine mrs man of business the erstwhile portly mother of daughters and the only begetter of her spouse's success really if you saw her in her boudoir in her carriage at prince's at the opera at brighton or at monte carlo you would not recognize her she is young and slim her hair is of flax she has rings on her fingers and probably bells on her toes her diamonds are the envy of duchesses and as for margarine my dear i never think either about it or him my little boys are at eton and dicky is going into the guards sometimes even mr and mrs man of business manage to get presented then as you may say their cup runneth over hand in hand they stand upon their pisca and stare at the pacific as it were there are no more worlds to conquer they come down with a light upon their faces and margarine sons brothers and company can be hanged in point of fact margarine sons brothers and company sooner or later becomes margarine sons brothers and company limited margarine himself drops out taking with him all the money he can get when he comes to die if you said margarine he would do his best to insult you that is all of course i have taken an extreme case but apparently the desire of the latter-day english man of business is wholly in these directions be he in a great or small way he is fain to step westward he is fain to live as the barbarians and to be indistinguishable from them and rather than be beaten he will enter into that kingdom piecemeal surpluses that would have gone to consolidation and extension in the old days now go to personal and feminine expenditure bond street captures what the wise would have dumped into threadneedle street and instead of resting our hope upon the business methods of benjamin franklin and samuel budget our heart inclines to the excellent precepts of our millionaire friend yes indeed which is to say that the English man of business, like the English sportsman, is dying out of the land. Whether his loss will be deplored by countless thousands is another question. Anyway, he is going. Chapter 4. The Journalist I am dealing here with the English journalist because, in my opinion, after the English sportsman and the English man of business, there is nothing under the sun so wonderfully English and so fearfully foolish. The elegant and austere writer who gave us the unspeakable Scott 
has said much which he no doubt hoped would lead people to believe that the british press was entirely in the hands of scotsmen and that this accounted at once for its dullness and its continual advertisement of scottish virtues for my own part i have no hesitation in asserting that mr crossland's view of the situation is quite a mistaken one in any case it is obvious that even if fleet street be as mr crossland suggests eaten up with louts from over the border the english journalist is not yet wholly extinct and somewhere in the land the remnant of him stands valiantly to its guns it is well known however that as a fact the remnant very largely outnumbers its hated rival the proportion of scots to the proportion of englishmen on the staffs of most newspapers being probably no higher than as one is to three so that for the stodginess and flat-footedness of the english newspaper the epithets are mr crossland's own the englishman is at least equally to blame with the scot mr crossland's main complaint against the newspaper press of his country is that it lacks brilliance so far as i am aware it has never before been asserted that the function of a newspaper is to be brilliant news is news all over the world to write brilliantly of a dog-fight or of the suicide of a defaulting clerk may be mr crossland's ambition in life but most persons possessing such an ambition would transfer their finical attentions from the field of journalism to that of belletra no doubt if mr crossland had his way the morning papers in which the soul of the average englishman is so delighteth would be published from the bodley head or at the sign of the unicorn or haply at mr grant richards it is not my intention however to enter into a sort of ten nights discussion with mr crossland he has had his say and taken the whipping he deserved my business is with the english journalist and while i shall not descend to personalities in dealing with him i hope to show that his brilliance and liveliness and spartness though much vaunted are neither a boon nor a blessing either to journalism as a force or to society at large i think that it may be fairly set down for a fact that the fine flower and consummate expression of english journalism is the halfpenny newspaper at any rate nobody would pretend to find in the halfpenny newspaper the sententious dullness and flat-footedness which are supposed to characterize the journalistic work of the scot the smartness of the halfpenny press is indeed not even american there is but one epithet for it and that is english Broadly speaking, its appeal is directly and exclusively to the bathotic. In England, the bathotic has always had the majority in its grip. The majority notoriously has no mind. It is a thing of one emotion, an instrument of one stop. On that stop, the bathotic stop, the English journalist makes a point of playing. There has been a time in his history when he believed in the educative possibilities and duties of his profession. He long held with the Scot that the press was a power, and that it was becoming that it should glory in being a power for the betterment of the race. After many shrewd searchings and commercial gropings, the English journalist discovered that the way to fame and fortune lay in the mastery of the bathotic stock he learned to sing songs of araby in one squalid key every morning and he has since been able to keep a gig and outcirculate everything that considers itself possessed of circulation he has played as one might say old harvey with the daily telegraph he has put the times to the shame of being a journal that nobody reads more than all he has said flatly to the english people you are a rabbit-brained crowd and here for your delectation and your coppers is the worst that can be written for you when england comes to her day of reckoning in the hour when she shall see her own mischance and is fain to remember the names of her destroyers none of them will seem to her so flagrant and so to be deprecated as the english journalist behold she will say the monster who convinced me that it was beautiful to split infinitives that it was elegant to begin six paragraphs on one page with the blessed statement a dramatic scene was enacted in mr thingamabob's court yesterday 
that good books are to be worthily pronounced upon by sub-editors in the intervals of waiting for the three o'clock winner and that so far from being a reproach to one the bathotic was the only honourable and creditable attitude of mind if a man wished to perceive to what degraded passes the art of writing may come and yet retain the qualities of intelligibility and apparent reasonableness let him peruse the morning papers and die the death the reek and offence of them smells to heaven they are a sure indication of the decadence of the english mind and of the cupidity and unscrupulousness of the english journalist there has been nothing like them nothing to compare with them for cheapness and futility and banality in the history of the world they are more to be fearful of than the pestilence inasmuch as they spell intellectual debasement the corruption of the public taste and the defilement of the public spirit their very literal innocuousness condemns them it is their boast that they may be read in the family without a blush their assumption of morality and puritanical straight-lacedness is admirable beneath it there lie a licentiousness of purpose a disregard for what is just and a contempt for what is decent and of good report which are calculated to make the angels weep when one inquires into the personnel of the staffs by which these papers are run one is confronted with exactly the kind of man one expects to meet first of all he is english and as shallow and flippant and irresponsible as only an englishman can be the saving touch of seriousness does not enter into his composition he neither reads nor thinks beer billiards and free lunches free entry to the less edifying places of amusement a minimum of work and a maximum of pay constitute his ideal of the journalist's career and he is always doing his best to live up to it of responsibility to anybody save his immediate chief who after all is only himself at a little higher salary he has not the smallest notion his duty is neither by himself nor by the public all that is expected of him is loyalty to his chief and to his paper and it is his pride and joy that this loyalty is invariably forthcoming very occasionally one hears that in consequence of a change in the political policy of a newspaper the editor of that paper has considered it to be his duty to resign his editorship probably not more than two such resignations have occurred in english journalism during the past twenty years in both instances the self-denying editors have been held up by the english papers as sublime examples of honour and a martyrdom that there is nothing extraordinary in sticking to one's principles even though it means loss of livelihood does not appear to have dawned upon the lively english mind of course it will be said that if every member of the staff of a newspaper down even to the junior reporters were allowed to have beliefs and principles and were not expected to write anything in antagonism to them an exceedingly remarkable kind of newspaper would result compromise at any rate on established matters must be the rule of the journalist's life on the other hand i incline to the opinion that the english journalist is far too swift to acquiesce in doubtful procedure and that where the morals good report and high character of a paper are concerned it is better to have a scotch staff than an english one nothing is more characteristic of the english journalist of to-day than the circumstance that he is literally without opinions of his own he takes his opinions from his chiefs just as his chiefs take their opinions from their proprietors or from the wire-pullers with whose party the paper happens to be associated in a sense it is impossible that it should be otherwise yet you will find that in the main scottish journalists do have opinions of their own and that somehow they manage to be loyal to them for weal or woe the scot is immovable and unchangeable as the granite of his own hills you can never get him to see that half measures are either desirable or necessary he will not stretch his conscience nor palter with his soul for any man or any man's money the englishman is all the other way that is why he makes such a nimble and even brilliant journalist End of chapter four chapter five the employed person 
the english are a nation of employed persons wherever you go from berwick to land's end you will find that in the main the men you meet are somebody's employees the better kind of them possibly write manager on their cards some of them even are managing directors others again are partners in wealthy houses or heads of such houses yet as i have said they strike you almost to a man as being in somebody's employment even the most prosperous of them have the strained repressed furtive look which comes of the long turning of other people's little wheels while the masses the employed english masses give you as regards appearance physique and habit of mind alike an excellent notion of what a galley slave must have been the fact of being employed is indeed the only big and abiding fact in the average englishman's life it has its effect on the whole man from the time of his youth to the time of his death it influences his actions and the trend of his thoughts to a far greater extent than any other force love and religion included in the englishman's view to be employed is the only road to subsistence and if one be ambitious the only road to honour he must work for somebody otherwise he cannot be happy the notion of working for himself appalls him and if by any chance he be persuaded to take the plunge the consideration that he has no master weighs so heavily upon him that his end is usually speedy ruin of one sort or another that is to say he either takes advantage of his freedom to the extent of doing no work at all or in the absence of the guiding hand he loses his judgment and throws to the winds the caution that kept him his place it is a pity there can be no doubt but the thing is in the english blood if you are an englishman you must be employed if you are unemployed you are unhappy and worse for a full century the rich merchants enterprising manufacturers colliery owners mill owners and what not in whom the english put their trust have been preaching and fomenting this doctrine by every means in their power to their aid in spreading the glorious truth they have brought the moralists and the churches if a man will not work neither shall he eat servants obey your masters punctuality is the soul of business be faithful over a few things begin at the bottom rung of the ladder mr so-and-so the notorious billionaire was once a poor working boy in manchester furthermore if you don't work and at our price well to say the least of it god will not love you and the english poor bodies carry on their lives accordingly the whole scheme of things is arranged to fit in with the ideas of employers as to what work means under what conditions it should be performed and what should be its rewards to live in the manner pronounced to be respectable by the moralists and the churches you must take upon yourself exactly the labours and no others prescribed by the employers in other words to keep an eight-roomed house with a piano in it a wife with blouses and four new hats a year and a little family who can go to church on sunday mornings dressed as well as any of them you must keep messrs reachem down's books and pass through your hands many thousands of messrs reachem down's monies for a salary of a hundred and fifty pounds a year when you get old and half blind through years of poring over reachem down's figures they will pension you off at a pound a week and get a younger man to do the work for the other two pounds you good easy englishmen will in your heart of hearts be exceedingly grateful to reachem down and reachem down and count it not the least of your many blessings that you have never wanted good work and kind employers you will say to your english son my boy make up your mind to serve people well and in your old age they will never forget you always be industrious obliging and respectful remember that a rolling stone gathers no moss and never forsake the substance for the shadows and the chances are that your fine english boy will do exactly what you his fine english father have done indeed if he be old enough at the time of your retirement he might very appropriately take your place at reach em down and reach em downs then he will marry he will live in a house with a piano in it his wife will have four new hats a year and his children will go to church on sunday as well dressed as any of them on the whole i should be sorry to say that this sort of thing was not desirable 
if a nation is to be great it is essential that it should contain a large body of workers and the more industrious and dependable and trustworthy that body of workers the better it is for the state and for the pillars and props of the state the employers included but the point is that the english take too much credit for it and get too much ease out of it it has been complained by mr crossland and other masters of elegant english that the scot goes to london and the smaller industrial markets and there enters into successful competition with the english employed and it appears to annoy mr crossland that the scot should not be content with good work say uh, bookkeeping from nine to six good wages say a hundred and fifty pounds per annum and kind employers say messrs richam down and reachem down all his life it seems to annoy him too that the scot never acquires that pathetic satisfaction in being employed which permeates the beautiful spirit of his english competitor you will meet ory and bald-headed englishmen who will tell you with a quaver that they have been in the employment of one and the same house man and boy for over half a century sir somehow the englishman tells you this with a look of pride and rather expects you to regard him as a sort of marvel it never occurs to him that he is really bragging of his own ineptitude to use mr crossland's favorite abstraction his own lack of enterprise the number of scots who have been in the employment of one house for forty years least of all the number of scots who brag about it is probably not a round dozen as a general rule when a scot has been in a house forty years it is his house another matter in which the english employee appears to me to err mightily is his treatment of his employer in concerns of great magnitude personal relations between employer and employed are often impossible because the employer seldom comes near the place where his money is made for him quite frequently however he is accessible yet the employee knows him not he would no more think of walking up and shaking hands with him than he would think of casting himself from the top of the factory chimney stack it is the unwritten law of the english that the employer is a better man than the employed for the employee to say how do to the employer for the employee to meet the employer in the street and omit to make respectful obeisances for the employee to assert anywhere outside his favorite pot-house that jack's as good as his master would never do if you are paid wages you must be grateful and respectful and though you know quite well that your employer is paying you just as little as ever he can you must still respect him broadly speaking we manage these things better in scotland and for that matter the scot manages them better in england the english employee quirks and crawls before his employer because he knows that his employer can exercise over him powers which if they do not mean exactly life and death do mean a possibly long period of out-of-workness and out-of-workness is as a rule the most fearful thing in life that can happen to an englishman for the simple reason that he never has anything behind him if he has been earning fifty pounds a year he has spent it all if he has been earning a thousand a year he has spent it all and more to it with a scot it is different no matter how small his earnings he invariably contrives to save a portion of them when he has saved a hundred pounds he is practically an independent man for a scot with a hundred pounds at his disposal can defy and can afford to defy any employer that ever breathed the breath of life besides hundred pounds or no hundred pounds the scot will not grovel he does his work and his duty and the rest can go hang his days are not spent in blissful contemplation of the joys of being in good work he has no anxieties as to how long it is going to last he admits no superiorities he is afraid of no man some day perhaps the englishman will learn to take a leaf out of his book the englishman will learn that to be employed excepting with a view to greater things than subsistence is to be in a condition which borders very closely on degradation he will learn that services rendered and energies expended for long periods of years without adequate reward and with only a pretense at advancement are a discredit and not an honor he will learn that a man's a man and that it is no man's business to be so faithful to another man that he cannot be faithful to himself 
Chapter 6. Chiffon it pains me beyond measure to say it but i think there can be no doubt that the accumulated experience and wisdom of mankind goes to show that at the bottom of most troubles there is a woman since eve and the first debacle it has been a woman all along the line i do not say that it is her fault but the fact remains white hands cling to the bridle rein and the horse proceeds accordingly it is woman that shapes our ends rough hew them as we will she has a delicate finger in everybody's pie no matter who you are some woman has got you by a little bit of a string occasionally you are the better for being so entangled but nine times out of ten it is a misfortune for you when one comes to look closely at the decadence of the english and endeavours to account for it in a plain way and without fear or prejudice one cannot help perceiving that here again one has a pronounced case of woman 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 further and once more i pray that i may not seem impolite the woman with whom you have to contend in england though her hand be full of power is not perhaps a woman after all i sometimes think that she may be best and most properly expressed in the word chiffon whatever she may have been in the past however sweet however demure however capable however beautiful the englishwoman of to-day is just a foolish doll a thing of frills and fluff and patchouli a daughter of vanity and a worshipper of dressmakers under her little foot under her mild blue greedy eye the englishman has become a capering carpet knight one who dallies at high noon a buck a dandy an unconvinced flippancy the shadow of his former self be he father or merely husband of the fair his case is pretty much the same both at home if he can find it in his heart to call his conglomeration of cosy corners home and abroad it is chiffon that runs him chiffon must have a house full of fallals so must the englishman chiffon delights in chippendale that a sixteen-stone male person dare not sit upon so does the englishman chiffon must dine late off french kickshaws with champagne to them so must the englishman chiffon must not have more than two children whom she must visit and kiss once a day it is the same with the englishman chiffon does not like the way in which you are running your newspaper the englishman forthwith runs his newspaper another way chiffon does not like that cross-eyed clerk of yours she is sure there is something wrong with him she wouldn't trust him with a hairpin my dear he gets fired chiffon is fond of motor-cars and tiaras of diamonds and eight guinea hats and three or four new frocks a week and she hates to be worried about money matters poor little chiffon says the good kind englishman she shall be happy even though we drift sweetly toward carey street we must keep it up though the heavens fall and when i come to think of it i have read somewhere of a man who had only five hundred pounds a year and is now in receipt of sixteen thousand pounds simply through marrying an expensive wife lower down the scale it is just the same chiffon will have this chiffon will have that and so will the englishman it is only four three a yard and it will make up lovely the englishman never doubts that it will chiffon discovers that chiffon next door has got an oak parlor organ and a case of birds on the installment system she is getting them off a scotsman says chiffon and i want some too dry those pretty eyes says the englishman i will apply at once for an extra two bob a week and it shall be done the children of chiffon next door are taking music lessons off a lady in reduced circumstances chiffon's children are as good as the children of chiffon next door any day in the week they too shall take music lessons the englishman concurs this of course is all when you are married to her when you are chiffon's fiance she would not have you say sweetheart or lover for worlds you enjoy what is commonly called in england a high old time first of all she will flirt with you till your reason rocks upon its throne then when you are about as confused as a little boy who has fallen out of a balloon she brings you to the idiot point informs you that it is so sudden and that she doesn't quite know what you mean and asks you if you do not think it would have been more manly on your part to have spoken first with her papa 
being an englishman and having nothing better to do you put up with it and go guiltily off to chiffon's delectable male parent he inquires into your income in pretty much the manner of a person who is going to lend you twenty pounds on note of hand only grunts a bit asks to be excused while he has a word with the missus comes back says yes you can have her and next morning you find yourself on the same old stool in front of the same old shiny desk wondering what in the name of heaven you have done there is a three years courtship all starch and theatre tickets and bouquets and fretfulness and anxiety there is a wedding pageant got up specially for the purpose of annoying the neighbours you have a whirling twenty minutes before a company of curates who persist in calling you by the wrong name you go home in shivers you drink soda water to prevent you from getting drunk you make a speech in the tone of a man who has just been hung you find yourself feeling rather queer aboard the dover packet and chiffon is yours such an experience at a time of life when a man is callow shy full of nerves and unversed in the serious matters of life is bound to leave its mark upon the character it takes the heart out of most men and some of them never get it back again it is an english institution and a stupid one like many other english institutions it has its basis in pretentiousness and display instead of in the vital issues of life in scotland we make marriages on different and more serious principles there are no chiffons in scotland whether maids or matrons consequently in scotland there are precious few fools hard heads sound sense high spirits indomitable will inexhaustible energy are not the offspring of mamas who know more about cosmetics than about swaddling clothes and who suckle their children out of patent food tins one of the rebukers of mr crossland has pointed out with some pertinence that the scotswoman approximates more closely to the wise man's view of what a good wife should be than almost any other kind of woman in the world here as mr crossland would say is solomon who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands she is like the merchant's ships she bringeth her food from afar she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens she considereth a field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms she perceiveth that her merchandise is good her candle goeth not out by night she layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff she stretches out her hand to the poor yea she reaches forth her hands to the needy she is not afraid of the snow for her household for all her household are clothed with scarlet her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant strength and honour are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come she openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness her children arise up and call her blessed her husband also and he praiseth her yes mr crossland it is very 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 scotch what poor little chiffon would think of it if it were put before her as a standard of wifely qualification and duty nobody but the englishman knows perhaps she would shrug her shoulders and say how absurd perhaps she would not understand it at all the englishwoman's love of petty display and cheap fripperies her desire to outshine the neighbours and to put all she has on her back and to pass everywhere for a woman of means and station no doubt had its beginning in the laudable anxiety to make the best of things unfortunately however the tendency has been developed out of reason to the neglect of the qualities which make a woman the inspiration and strength of a man's life to dress and to talking and thinking about it the englishwoman devotes unconscionable hours the bare business of robing and disrobing takes up pretty well half her waking day her transference from the bath to the breakfast table cannot be accomplished under fifty minutes before she will appear in the open she will make yet another toilette 
she is a full twenty minutes tidying herself before lunch in the afternoon there is an hour of getting into tea-gowns and crowning right of all my lady strips for dinner from morn to dewy eve her little mind is busy with dress the shopping over which she makes such a fuss is almost invariably a matter of new frocks new hats new shoes new feathers matching this exchanging that sitting on high stools before pomatumed counter-skippers and dissipating in the purchase of sheer superfluities gold that men have toiled for her visiting is equally an unmitigatingly dressy affair she goes to see her friends frocks not her friends and it is the delight of her soul to turn up in toilettes which render her friends frankly and miserably envious of the real purport of clothes she knows nothing and if you endeavour to explain it to her she will charge you with the wish to make an old frump of her before her time as for the expense of it all she never bothers her pretty head about money matters she tells you in the most childlike way that her account at the bank seems to be perpetually overdrawn but that randall is a dear kind boy though he does swear a bit when some of the bills come in besides she says i am sure it helps him in his profession to have a well-dressed wife and the pity of it is that quite frequently the person upon which these adornments are lavished is really not worth the embellishment and would indeed be far better served and make a far better show in the least elaborate of garments for notoriously the physique of the englishwoman of the middle and upper classes is not now what it was in height in figure in suppleness and grace of build the scottish woman can give her english sister many points in the matter of facial beauty too the englishwoman cannot be said particularly to shine at a drawing-room at the opera the beauty of england spreads itself for your gaze and the amazing lack both of beauty and the promise of it appalls you if we are to believe the society papers there is not an ugly nor a plain-featured woman of means in all broad england every week the english illustrated journals give you pages of photographs beneath which you may read in entrancing capital letters the beautiful miss snooks or lady beer taps two beautiful daughters yet the merest glance at these photographs convinces you that miss snooks is about as good-looking as the average kitchen wench while the two beautiful daughters of lady beer tap have faces like the backs of cabs the fact is that the so-called english beauty is a rare thing and a fragile thing fully seventy-five per cent of englishwomen are not beautiful to look upon of the other twenty-five per cent one here and there perhaps one in a thousand could stand beside the venus of milo without blenching for the rest they have a girlish prettiness which accompanies them into their thirtieth year and sickens slowly into a sourness at forty little chiffon who was so pretty at twenty has crow's feet and flat cheeks and a distinct tendency to the nutcracker's type of profile End of chapter six chapter seven the soldier with a tow row 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 for the british grenadiers which of course means the english grenadiers inasmuch as there never were any scottish grenadiers to-day however the english do not sing this song their grandfathers delighted in it and the tune still survives as a soldier man's march but when the modern english wish to celebrate the english soldier vocally they do it in their own decadent bathotic way they have an idiot song called tommy atkins the chorus of which goes somewhat in this wise oh tommy atkins you're a good and heart and hand you're a credit to your nation and to your native land may your hand be ever ready may your heart be ever true god bless you tommy atkins here's your country's love to you and since the outbreak of the late war at any rate the english do not speak of soldiers but of tommies and the principal english poet has gone farther and dubbed them absent-minded beggars since the outbreak of the war too it has been necessary to issue from time to time words of caution to the great english public 
lord roberts a little bobs i suppose i should call him in the choice english fashion has on two or three occasions deemed it advisable to let it be known that his desire was that the great english public should discontinue the practice of treating cape bound or returned tommies to alcoholic stimulants and substitute therefor mineral water or cocoa this was very wise on little bobs's part and it has no doubt saved at least two cape bound or returned tommies from the degradation of an almighty drunk i mention this because it illustrates in an exceedingly quaint way the attitude of the english towards the soldier when there is war toward the soldier is absolutely the most popular kind of man in england in peace time an english soldier is commonly credited with being socially vile and unpresentable there is a popular conundrum which runs what is the difference between a soldier and a mere sham pipe and the answer i regret to say is one is the scum of the earth and the other the scum of the sea tommy's place in the piping times of peace is just at the bottom of the social ladder there he must stay and drink four ale and smoke cheap shag and sit at the back of the gallery in places of amusement then war comes along and the english bosom expands to the sound of the distant drum and to the rumour of still more distant carnage who is it that's a-working this here bloomin war blessed if it ain't our old friend tommy atkins fetch him out of the four ale bar at once the nation's heroes have no business in four ale bars the saloon bar is the place for them and the barmaid shall smile upon them and they shall have free drinks and free cigars till all's blue for they are the nation's heroes and they deserve well their country furthermore if they wish to visit those great and glorious centres of enlightened entertainment commonly called the halls they shall no longer be stuffed obscurely away in the rear portion of the gallery but they shall come out into the light of things they shall come blushingly and amid acclaim into the pit or the stalls or for that matter into any part of the house throughout the war this has been so it was so till yesterday but the ancient english smugness has begun to assert itself once more and tommy dear tommy god bless you tommy in fact finds staring him in the face as of yore soldiers in uniform not served in this compartment soldiers in uniform cannot be admitted to any part of this theatre except the gallery the english kipling hit the whole matter off in his vulgar way when he wrote tommy i went into a theatre as sober as could be they gave a drunk civilian room but they hadn't none for me they sent me to a gallery or round the music halls but when it comes to fightin lord they'll shove me in the stalls for it's tommy this and tommy that and tommy wait outside but it's special train for atkins when the soldier's on the tide the troop ship's on the tide my boys the troop ship's on the tide oh it's special train for atkins when the trooper's on the tide we were told that this war if it were doing england no other good was at least bringing her to a right understanding of the soldier man it was teaching her to take him by the hand to recognize in him a creditable son and an essential factor in the state it has ended in the way in which pretty well every english revival does end namely in smoke though england has as much need of the soldier and is as much dependent upon him for peace and security as any other nation she has never been able excepting as i have said in time of war to bring her greedy mind to the pass of doing him the smallest honour or of rendering to him that measure of social credit which is obviously his by right that the english tommy is not altogether a delectable person however goes i think without saying according to general buller and other more or less competent authorities the men in south africa were splendid i do not doubt it in the least on the other hand the returns from that country have not struck one as reaching a high standard of savouriness or manliness and however splendid he may have been as a campaigner as an ex-campaigner the english tommy has scarcely shown so that in a sense the changed attitude of the english public mind towards him is not to be wondered at elsewhere in this essay i have pointed out that the late war has not reflected any too much credit upon that chiefest of snobs the english military officer 
to go into the army has long been considered good form among the english barbarians and to be an officer in a swagger regiment may be reckoned one of the best passports to english society it gives a man a tone and puts him on a footing with the highest because an officer is a gentleman in a very special sense but it is well known that during the past half century or so the english barbarians have been too prone to put their sons into the army for social considerations only and without regard to their qualification or call for the profession of arms and in the long result it has come to pass that the english army is officered by men who know as little as possible and care a great deal less about their profession and are compelled to leave the instruction and as often as not the leadership of their men to non-commissioned officers over and over again in the south african campaign it was the commissioned officer who blundered and brought about disaster and the non-commissioned officers and the horse sense of the rank and file that saved whatever of the situation there might be left to save probably the true history of the british reverses major and minor in south africa will never be made public but i believe it can be shown that in almost every instance it was the incapacity or remissness of the english commissioned officer which lay at the root of the trouble the fact is that the monocled montebank who is in the army don't you know seldom or never understands his job he is too busy messing and dancing and flirting and philandering and racing and gambling and speeding the time merrily ever to learn it that the honour of britain and the lives of englishmen scotsmen and irishmen should be in his listless damp hand for even as long as five minutes is an intolerable scandal that he should haw and haw and yaw and yaw on the barrack square and take a salary out of the public purse for doing it shows exactly how persistently stupid the english can be of course the common reply to any attack upon these shallow pated incompetence is that you must have gentlemen for the king's commissions and that the pay the king's commissions carry is so inadequate that no gentleman unpossessed of private means can afford to take one this is a very pretty argument and exceedingly english the money will not run to capable men therefore let us fling it away on fools army reform sweeping changes at the war office new army regulations an army on a business footing and so on and so forth are always being clamoured for by the english people and always being promised by the english government but until the day when the granting of commissions and promotion are as little dependent upon social influence and the influence of money as advancement in the law or advancement in the arts the english army will remain just where it is and just as rotten as it is for downright childishness the modern english soldier whether he be officer or file man has perhaps no compeer when the south african war broke out tommy and his officers were men of scarlet and pipe clay and gold lace and magnificent headdresses also all drill was in close order you were to shove in your infantry first supported by your artillery and deliver your last brilliant stroke with your cavalry the men should go into the fray with bands playing flags flying and dressed as for parade you commenced operations with move number one the enemy would assuredly reply with move number two you would then rush in with move number three there would be a famous victory and the streets of london would be illuminated at great expense in south africa matters did not quite pan out that way the enemy declined absolutely to play the stereotyped war game for the very simple reason that they did not know it and that south africa is not quite of the contour of a chessboard and so the english had to change their cherished system and to learn to ride and to throw their pretty uniforms into the old clothes baskets and to get out of their old drill into a drill which was no drill at all and to give up resting their last hope on the british square and to get accustomed to deadly conflict with an enemy whom they never saw and who never took the trouble to inform them whether they had beaten him or not it was all very trying and all very bewildering and it is to the credit of the english army that in the course of a year or two it did actually manage to understand the precise nature of the work cut out for it and made some show of dealing with it in a workmanlike way here was a lesson for us and we learned it 
an englishman you know can learn anything when he makes up his mind to it and he has learned this south african lesson thoroughly well so well indeed that it looks like being the only lesson he will be able to repeat any time in the next half century for what has he done well to judge by appearances we must reason this way i was not prepared for this south african business it was a new thing to me it gave me a new notion of the whole art and practice of war the old authorities were clean out of it therefore i solemnly abjure the old authorities for the future i wear slouch hats and khaki and puttees and a jacket full of pockets and i drill for the express notion that i may some day meet a boer farmer the entire sartorial and general aspect of my army shall be remodelled on lines which might induce one to think that the sole enemy of mankind was mr kruger and the great military centre of the world was pretoria it does not seem to occur to the poor body that his next great trial is not in the least likely to overtake him in south africa he has had to fight on the continent of europe before to-day and i shall not be surprised if he has to do it again before many years have passed over his head yet wherever his next large fighting has to be done you will find that he will sail into it in his good old infantile stupid english way armed cap a pie for the special destruction of boars it is just gross want of sense and that is all that can be said for it chapter eight the navy since trafalgar the english navy has been the apple of the englishman's eye he holds that the english power is a sea power that these leviathans afloat the king's ships are his first line of defence and that so long as he keeps the english navy up to the mark he can defy the world his method of keeping it up to the mark is most singular it consists of tinkering with old ships generation after generation laying down new ones which seemingly never get finished and of being chronically short of men the naval critics of england may be divided sharply into two camps in the one we have a number of gentlemen who are naval critics simply because they happen to be connected with newspapers these young persons are naturally anxious to do the best that can be done for their papers and for themselves they recognize that if they are to be in a position to obtain immediate and first-hand information not to say exclusive information as to naval doings they must stand well with the admiralty and the authorities the admiralty and the authorities are not in need of adverse critics what they like and what they will have are smiley wily reporters who will swear with the official word see with the official eye and take the rest for granted in the other camp of naval critics you have a bright collection of book compilers naval architects and patent mongers all of which have some sort of fad to exploit or some private axe to grind hence the amiable english taxpayer knows just as much at the present moment about his navy as he knew three years ago about his army in spite of the perverted assurances of mr kipling and of the ill-written anti-scare manifestos of the morning papers the english taxpayer knows in his heart that all is not so well as it might be with the english navy what is wrong the english taxpayer cannot tell you but there it is and he has a sort of feeling that when the big sea tussle comes the english navy being tried will be found wanting herein i think he shows great prescience the superstition to the effect that the english rule the waves has of late begun to be known for what it is there are nowadays other richmonds in the field all bent on doing a little wave ruling on their own account and after the first start of surprise and astonishment the sleepy slack undiscerning englishman has just let things go on as they were and has just dilly-dallied what time the new wave rulers were building and equipping the finest battleships that modern science can put afloat and making arrangements for the acquisition of as much naval supremacy as they can lay their hands on and whether the english navy be or not be as efficient as the admiralty and the admirals would have us believe it is quite certain that in consequence of budding wave rulers the english navy is not on the whole so formidable a weapon or so impregnable a defence as it ought to be the fact is that in the matter of naval strength offensive and defensive the english are just a quarter of a century behind 
they slept whilst their good friends the french the russians and the germans were climbing upward in the dark and when they woke it was to perceive that another navy had sprung into existence by the side of the english navy and that the task of catching up of putting the old navy into a position of absolute supremacy over the new was well nigh an impossible one you cannot build line of battle ships in an hour furthermore the yards of england though capable of extraordinary achievements are not capable of a greater output than the yards of france russia and germany conjoined half a century ago the english had a distinct and preponderating start when the other powers began to show increased activity in the matter of shipbuilding the english said oh, it is of no consequence let them build they threw their start clean away the probabilities are that they will never be able to regain it quite apart from the large general question however and granting that on paper england's sea power is equal to that of any three powers combined it cannot have escaped the attention of the interested that the foreign naval experts view our whole flotilla with a singular calm and appear to be quite amused when we talk of naval efficiency and advancement it is pretty certain that this calm and this amusement are not based entirely in either ignorance or arrogance ships built and fitted in continental yards may lack the advantage of being english built but they are fighting ships nevertheless and they have not much to lose by comparison with the best english fighting ships even when the comparison is made by english experts indeed it is very much open to question whether some of the continental ships are not a long way ahead of some of the best english ships in destructive power and possibilities for fight of course the common reply to this is that it is no good having a fine machine unless you have the right man to handle it and jack of course the honest english jack is the only man in the world that really knows how to handle fighting ships well it may be so or it may not be so the englishman will undoubtedly keep his engines going and stick to his guns till chaos engulfs him it seems possible too that he has made himself thoroughly familiar with every detail of the machine he has got to work and that he knows his business in a way which leaves precious little room for more intimate knowledge in spite of all this however it cannot be denied that the continental navy man is slowly but surely creeping up to the english standard that as a rule he is a man of better family than the english navy man that his conditions of service are more favourable and that his food and accommodation are better are all in his favour he may lack the steadiness and the grit of the old original English hearts of oak, still he is coming on and making progress, whereas the old original English hearts of oak do not appear to be getting much forwarder. Besides, it is well known that the English do not possess anything like enough of them, and those whom they do possess have such a love for the service that they take particularly good care to warn would-be recruits off it from time immemorial the english have made a point of treating the saviors of their country meanly and shabbily in the crimea the english troops were half starved and went about in rags while a lot of broad-shouldered genial englishmen made fortunes out of army contracts it was the same in the transvaal and it will be the same whenever england is at war in peace time she does manage to keep her soldiers and sailors decently dressed but it is notorious that she nips them in the paunch and that the roast beef and plum pudding and flagons of october which are supposed to be the meat and drink of john bull are not considered good for his brave defenders a beef-fed army and a beef-fed navy are what englishmen believe they get for their money the rank and file of the army and navy are better informed with a navy that is undersized, undermanned, underfed, and underpaid, the English chances of triumph, when her real strength is put to the test, are problematical. Meanwhile, we may comfort ourselves with Mr. Kipling and the Daily Telegraph. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9. The Churches » the english have one sauce but the number of their religions is as the sands of the sea 
roughly speaking they divide themselves religiously into two classes anglicans and nonconformists the anglicans one may say are reformed catholics the nonconformists reformed anglicans apparently all english religions with the exception of course of the catholic religion which is not counted date from or since the reformation we know what the reformation means in scotland though the english notion of it seems to be a trifle vague we also know in scotland what religion means i doubt if the english have any such knowledge one has only to visit an average anglican or nonconformist church on the sabbath to perceive that in england religion is under a cloud and has almost ceased to be a spiritual matter in the first place you will notice that the congregation is for the most part composed of women and children englishmen are too busy or too bored to go to church on the sabbath what little faith what little religious fervor or feeling they ever possessed has been knocked out of them and they no longer go to church and this change has been accomplished not by the failure of dogmas not by the spread of free thought not by secularists anti-clericalists or philosophers but simply by an indolent clergy on the one hand and cheap railway fares on the other the mediocre preacher and the new-fangled english weekend have emptied the churches of england's manhood the women and children are left a puling bemused crowd and to these the english shepherds and pastors blate their cheap ritual and read their ill-considered sermons it is curious to note how easily an english parson or nonconformist minister can make a reputation for greatness as a preacher let him be just a little more competent than the average and people flock to hear him i doubt if there is a really great preacher alive in england to-day yet there are three or four who pass for great and who are supposed to be in line with st paul john knox and wesley to give instances would be invidious but i have no hesitation in asserting that the preachments offered in london at the three or four great churches which are supposed to enshrine orators are as a rule exceedingly feeble efforts tricked out with gods and mannerisms packed with trite sentiment and utterly devoid of doctrine inspiration and value there are not three bishops on the english bench that can furnish forth a sermon worth going fifty yards to hear there is not a nonconformist minister who has a soul above stodginess convention and a convenient if threadbare scriptural tag the salvation army perhaps have the fervor and the courage but they lack wisdom and they have no art the congregationalists have some of the wisdom and a touch of the art but they have no fervor indeed wherever you turn you find that the recognized english religionists have given themselves up to a decadent hebraic emotion and let the solid things of the spirit the hebraic culture the hebraic vision the hebraic passion pass by them gradually the churches of this remarkable country are ceasing to have anything to do with religion at all religion be hanged say those who run them religion no longer appeals to the wayward stony-hearted overdriven half-educated english populace what is wanted is social brightness and warmth the religion of brotherhood and the full belly so that we will give magic lantern entertainments in our churches on the lord's day we will go in bald-headed for pleasant sunday afternoons hot coffee and veal and ham pies and screws of tobacco given away at the doors wrapped up in a tract which you are at liberty either to read or to light your pipe with as for the english priests that had the authenticity of god they are no longer sure whether they have that authority or not of course they believe they have it in a sacerdotal canonical and private way but not one of them dare stand up and swear by his powers publicly the bishops are all for peace and quietness if you please we are your friends and not your masters say they to their clergy and their clergy to use an english vulgarism wink the other eye and the clergy too in turn are the friends and not the masters of common men they are so much your friends indeed that providing you mount a silk hat on sunday and put a penny on the plate you can depend upon a friendly shake of the hand and a kindly grin of recognition six days in the week even though you happen to be a bookmaker or the keeper of a bucket shop for the nonconformist clergy if clergy they may be called 
they speak humorously at tea-parties they enter into hat-trimming competitions at bazaars and they play principal guest at the tables of overfed tradesmen there is not a man amongst them who can say boo to a goose there is not a man amongst them who as a social unit is worth a hundred and fifty pounds a year and a man's with ten pounds per annum for each child that a glozing unintellectual english congregation hands over to him out of the ease and security and respectability and dolce far niente which the church of england provides for a considerable proportion of her priests she has managed to evolve a few scholars a few men of letters perhaps an odd saint or two and an odd man of temperament and mark but what have the english nonconformists produced dr horton and dr parker and that g r sims of religionists the rev hugh price hughes to this distinguished triumvirate though the english nonconformist will hold up pious hands in horror at the notion one may add that valiant thumper of the pulpit drum general booth who is doing a work in religious decadence and abathetism which it will take centuries to undo want of heart and want of mind coupled with the blessed spirit of tolerance have indeed played havoc with the english churches the loosening of the grip of the church on english society has of course not been without its results on english morals and on english society at large there is a general feeling abroad that religion is played out that the system of hebrew ethics which has been drilled into the english blood by generations of the faithful was all very well for the faithful but is altogether impractical and out of harmony with the present intelligent times you will find englishmen nowadays complaining that the taint of spiritualism asceticism and ethical faith which they have inherited from their people is a source of hindrance to them in the matter of their commercial or social progress and their lives are spent in an endeavour to eradicate or to triumph over that taint the archbishop of canterbury could not run a tea-shop by the rules laid down in the sermon on the mount they will tell you and what is worse the archbishop of canterbury agrees with them take all thou hast and give it to the poor is out of the question even for dr horton since those blessed words were said we are told the poor law has sprung up we give all that is necessary for pauperism in the poor rate and thanks to the excellence of our social system it is now impossible for man woman or child to die of starvation provided only they will work i have heard it stated by an english nonconformist minister that his chief complaint against the roman catholic community in his district was their habit of being over liberal to the poor no man is refused observed my nonconformist friend no matter how dissolute or idle or irreligious he may be then in the large question of the employment of human flesh and blood to make money for you the modern englishman finds that he must either tear the effects of his religious bringing up out of his heart or forego the possibility of becoming really rich don't you know it is all a matter of supply and demand and if the mass of humanity live starved lives and die daily in order that i may be fat and warm and cultured and possessed of surpluses at banks it is not my fault you must really blame supply and demand with this fine phrase on his lips the english capitalist confutes all the philosophies and sets his foot on the majority of the decencies of life of course i shall be told that the prince and chief of all hidebound industrial capitalist is mr andrew carnegie who happens to be a scot and i cheerfully admit that mr carnegie is a very serious case in point but for our one mr carnegie the english have fifty mr carnegies they may not be so rich or so famous but there they are and the blood and spirit of the english people suffer accordingly the religion of the wealthy does not prevent them from grinding the face of the poor and the religion of the middle classes is of pretty much the same order it is at the hands of the english middle classes that the english poor suffer a further and a bitterer depredation for when you have earned money hardly you want good goods for it and the english middle classes who are nearly all shopkeepers either directly or indirectly make a point of palming off on you the very worst goods the law will allow them to sell 
and in spite of all the churches continue to open their doors new churches continue to be built million pound funds are raised the missionary speeds over the blue wave to the succor of the heathen and english women and children have their pleasant sunday afternoons and bishops keep high-stepping horses church and state are grappled together with hooks of steel and england is a christian country till the churches get out of their slippers and their sloth and their tea-bibbing and their tolerance matters will go on in the same old futile scandalous way if they are to have a charge and direction of the soul of man they must remember that the soul of man is a greater thing than ease and a greater thing than the church they must not play with the immortal part of humanity and they must not trifle with the things which they believe to be of god in no other country save england would such churches and such priests as the english now possess be tolerated or supported it is the english decadence which has rendered englishmen blind to the stupidity and banality of their pastors and spiritual guides and it is the english easy-heartedness which permits the game of cant and cadge and sham to go on unchecked End of chapter nine chapter ten the politician the flower and exemplar of well-nigh everything that is choicely and brutally english may be summed up in the english politician such a tub-thumper such a master of claptrap and the arts and feints and fetches of oratory has never been known before since the world began he is english and therefore he knows his business he has made a study of it as a business and without regard to its more serious issues his position is that if he would do himself well he must tie himself hand and foot to some party and serve that party through thick and thin then in the end and with good luck will come reward you may be born in a chandler's office by birth therefore you belong to the very lower english middle class through the practice of a number of commercial virtues and with the help of considerable speculation outside your own business you become wealthy now wealth without honour is nothing to an englishman he cannot brook that his wealth his shining glorious superfluity should be hidden under a bushel therefore he seeks municipal honours he becomes a town councillor an alderman a mayor even but these after all are not the summits they lead at best only to a common knighthood and any fool can get knighted if he wants to so you determine to seek parliamentary honours you subscribe liberally to the funds of your party and by and by a constituency is found for you to contest you lose the fight and subscribe again another constituency is found for you and you win by the skin of your teeth or with a plumping majority as the case may be you are now a full-blown member of parliament it is worth the money and much better than being a mayor up to this time you have been an orator of sorts you have held forth from schoolroom platforms and the tops of wagons what time the assembled populace shouted and threw up its sweaty nightcaps you have been carried shoulder high behind brass bands rendering see the conquering hero comes now however you are really in parliament and for the nonce for several years in fact you must give up talking there is plenty for you to do you may put questions on the paper you may get a look in at committee work you may show electors around the houses and you may go on subscribing liberally to the party funds when you have subscribed enough it is just within the bounds of possibility that the heads of the party the front bench people as it were will begin to discover that there is virtue in you you will be encouraged to make a speech or two at the slackest part of debates and some fine day you may be entrusted with the fortunes of a little bill which your party wishes to rush through all the while you are subscribing liberally to the party funds after many years when you are least expecting it the bottom seems to fall out of the universe that is to say there is a general election you have to fight your seat you win you come nobly back behold your party is in power then comes the grand moment of your life you are shoveled into the cabinet on account of services rendered from this point if you possess any ability at all you can have things pretty much your own way 
and if your ambition has been to hear yourself called my lord before you die and to see your wife in the peeress's gallery on great occasions and your sons swanking about town with honourable before their names you can manage it it is a slow job and it involves many years of hard work and lavish expenditure but it is politically possible in england for a man to be born on the flags and to die properly set forth in burke and debrett i do not say for a moment that the end and aim of every english politician is the peerage but i do say that as a rule his labours are directed toward some end of honour or emolument and seldom or never to the good of the state it is ambition and not patriotism that fires his bosom it is self-aggrandizement and not a desire for the welfare of the english people that keeps him going and it is party and not principle that guides and rules his legislative actions of course the great art of being a politician is to hide these facts from the public if you went down to your constituency like an honest man and said gentlemen i wish you to return me to parliament in order that i may make a high position for myself in order that i may become a man of rank and the founder of a family your constituency would hurl dead cats at you therefore you go down with an altogether different tale i am going to the house of commons gentlemen in your interests and not in mine it will cost me large sums of money besides which as your member i shall be expected to subscribe to all the local cricket clubs but i have the best interests of muckington at heart and if you honour me by making me your representative money is no object it is a wonderful business and a great and a glorious one stands in astonishment before the bright english intelligence which takes so much on promise and gets so little performed an english party never gets into power with the intention of doing more than half of what it has promised to do at election times its great business is to capture votes these must be had at any price short of rank bribery and once landed with the blessed the party immediately settles down not to the work of carrying out its promises but to the far more serious business of keeping itself in power from the point of view of the careless lay observer the house of commons is an assemblage for the discussion of imperial affairs with a view to their being managed in the best possible way to the politician it is just an arena in which two sets of greedy men meet to annoy thwart ridicule and bring about the downfall of each other the amount of interest the englishman is supposed to take in this amazing assemblage and its doings makes it plain that the englishman himself is well nigh as foolish and well nigh as oblique as the person whom he elects to represent him next to royalty itself there is nobody in england who can command so much attention and such a prominent place in the picture as the politician if he be a cabinet minister of any standing it is impossible for him to walk through the streets either of london or of any of the english provincial towns without being immediately recognized and respectfully saluted whereas if he happens to have come to any metropolitan district or provincial town on political business bent he may depend upon being received at the proper point by the local authorities supported by a guard of honour of the local volunteers and he may also depend upon more or less of an ovation on his way to and from the place of meeting year in and year out too the illustrated papers of every degree blossom with his latest photograph mr so-and-so in his new motor-car mr so-and-so playing golf mr so-and-so and the king mr so-and-so addressing the mob from the railway station these are pictures in which every englishman has delighted from his youth up and in which he will always find great artistic and moral satisfaction as for the journals which live out of the personal paragraph they must give or imagine they must give pride of place to the politician or perish little anecdotes of the sayings and doings of the politically great are always marketable it is not necessary that they should have the slightest foundation in truth but they must be neat reasonably amusing and flattering to the personage involved it is when one turns to the english daily papers however that one begins to understand what an extraordinary hold the political interest has upon the english public mind it is well known that in the main the debates in the house of commons are quite dull 
colorless and somnolent functions half of them take place in the presence only of the speaker and a quorum that is to say nine nights out of ten members spend the greater portion of their time in the smoke-rooms dining-rooms and lobbies and not in the house itself the simple reason being that as a rule the debates are not interesting when some reputable champion of either party gets on his legs or when some wag is up members manage to attend in force but it is only at these moments that they do so yet if you pick up an english morning newspaper you will find six columns of that sheet devoted to a report of the proceedings in parliament another three columns of descriptive matter bearing on the same proceedings and out of four or five leaders three at least deal with the political question of the moment even when parliament is not sitting the first leader is never by any chance other than political from the point of view of the dull english mind nothing more important than a political happening can happen in this world mr somebody has called mr somebody else a liar across the floor of the house of commons it is essential for the well-being of the country at large that the episode should be reported with a separate subhead and great circumstance in the parliamentary report that the scene should be described by the lively and picturesque pen of the writer of the parliamentary sketch that the appearance of the gentleman who called the other gentleman a liar should be dwelt upon in the notes that instances of other gentlemen having called gentlemen liars across the floor of the house should also be given in the notes and finally that a rotund and windy leader should be written wherein is discussed gravely the general advisability of gentlemen calling other gentlemen liars across the floor of the house wherein one is assured that in spite of occasional regrettable instances of the kind the english parliament is the most decorous and dignified assemblage under the sun and wherein we cannot refrain from paying our tribute of respectful admiration to the right honourable the speaker whose tact good sense and gentlemanlike spirit coupled with the firmness resolution and knowledge of the procedure of the house becoming to his high position invariably enable him to still the storm and to repress the angry passions of our heated legislators before any great harm has been done so that a gentleman who calls another gentleman a liar across the floor of the house of commons really renders a great service to englishmen inasmuch as he provides them with a gratuitous entertainment about which they may read talk and argue for at least twenty-four hours recognizing their own love of politics and political strife and knowing in their hearts that the talk in the house of commons not to mention the house of lords is generally speaking of the flattest and flabbiest one would imagine that the wise english would be at some pains to take measures calculated to brighten up the parliamentary debates and render them of real interest but no such precautions are taken when a would-be member of parliament is heckled he is never by any chance asked if he is prepared at the psychological moment to pull the nose of one of the right honourable gentlemen opposite any member of parliament who in the middle of a dull debate would walk across the floor and box the ears of say uh, mr balfour or lord hugh cecil would thereby earn for himself the distinction of being the best discussed and best described man in england for quite half a week considering the small amount of exertion required for such a proceeding and the very large amount of notoriety which would accrue to the person who ventured on it one wonders that it has never been done in spite of the abnormal share of publicity and applause which is extended to the english politician however the solemn fact remains that he is seldom a person of any real force capacity understanding or character commonplace mediocre insincere inept are the epithets which best describe him he passes through the legislative chamber or chambers says his say in undistinguished speeches casts his vote earns his place his pension or his peerage and passes beyond our echo and our hail the daily papers manufacture for him an obituary notice varying in length from five lines to a couple of columns and nobody wants to hear anything more about him as a matter of fact he has left the world neither wiser nor wittier nor happier than he found it 
if he has made one phrase or uttered one sentiment that sticks in men's minds he is fortunate neither history nor posterity will have anything to say about him although in his day he kicked up some fuss and took up a lot of room in short politics as a career in england is not a career for solid serious men it merely serves the turn of the specious the shallow the incompetent and the vainglorious End of chapter ten chapter thirteen poets it may be set down as an axiom that a nation which is in the proper enjoyment of all its faculties which is healthy wealthy wise and properly conditioned must be producing a certain amount of poetry from the beginning this has been so it will be so to the end when england was at her highest when the best in her was having full play she produced poets right down into the victorian era she went on producing them then she took to the stock exchange and an ostentatious way of life and the supply of poets fell off if we accept mr swinburne who does not belong rightfully to this present time there is not a poet of any parts exercising his function in england to-day furthermore any bookseller will tell you that the demand for poetry books by new writers has practically ceased to exist these statements will be called sweeping by a certain school of critics and i shall be asked to cast my eye round the english nest of singing birds and to answer and say whether mr so-and-so be not a poet and mr so-and-so and mr so-and-so and mr so-and-so i shall also be asked to say if i am prepared to deny that of mr so-and-so's last volume of verse three hundred copies were actually sold to the booksellers for the propounders of such questions i have one answer namely it may be so in the meantime let us do our best to find an english poet who is worth the name and who is prescriptively entitled to be mentioned in the category which begins with chaucer and ends with mr swinburne shall we try mr rudyard kipling tested by sales and the amount of dust he has managed to kick up mr kipling should be a poet of parts he is still young and happily among the living but it cannot be denied that as a poet he has already outlived his reputation two years ago he could set the english-speaking nations humming or reciting whatever he chose to put into metre some of his little things looked like lasting already the majority of them are forgotten to the next generation if he be known at all he will be known as the author of three pieces recessional the l'envoi appended to life's handicap and mandalay what is to become of such verses as the following have you heard of the widow at windsor with a hairy gold crown on her head she has ships on the foam she has millions at home and she pays us poor beggars in red ow oh, poor beggars in red there's her nick on the cavalry horses there's her mark on the medical stores and her troopers you'll find with a fair whim behind that takes us to various wars poor beggars barbarous wars and is to the widow at windsor and is to the stores and the guns the men and the horses that makes up the forces o oh, miss victorier's sons poor beggars victorier's sons at the time of their appearance these lines and the like of them were vastly admired everybody read them most people praised them they were supposed to stir the english blood like a blast of martial trumpets here at length was the poet england had been waiting for there could be no mistake about him he had the authentic voice the incommunicable fire the master touch he had come to stay at the present moment the bulk of his metrical work is just about as dead and forgotten as the coster songs of yesteryear he has not even made a cult nobody quotes him nobody believes in him as a poetical master nobody wants to hear any more of him his imitators have all gone back to the imitation of better men if a copy of verses have a flavor of kipling about it nowadays editors drop it as they would drop a hot coal so much for the poet of empire the poet of the people the metrical patron of thomas atkins esq another poet of empire mr w e henley has fared very little better 
what can i do for england is i believe still in request among the makers of a certain class of anthology but english poetry in the bulk is just the same as if mr henley had never been even the balderdash about my indomitable soul has fallen out of the usus loquende of young men's christian associations and young men's debating societies the song of the sword is sung no longer for england's sake has gone the way of all truculent war poetry and out of hawthorn and lavender perhaps a couple of lyrics remain mr henley attacked burns when burns had been a century dead who will consider it worth while to attack mr henley in say the year two thousand and two possibly the real true english poet who will in due course put on the laurel of mr austin is mr stephen phillips yet mr stephen phillips is a purveyor of metrical notions for the stage and in his last work ulysses i find him writing as follows athene father whose oath in hollow hell is heard whose act is lightning after thunder word a boon a boon that i compassion find for one the most unhappy of mankind zeus how is he named athene ulysses he who planned to take the towered city of troyland a mighty spearsman and a seaman wise a hunter and at need a lord of lies with woven wiles he stole the trojan town which ten years battle could not batter down oft hath he made sweet sacrifice to thee zeus nodding benevolently i mind me of the savory smell athene yet he when all the other captains had won home was whirled about the wilderness of foam for the wind and the wave have driven him evermore mocked by the green of some receding shore yet over wind and wave he had his will blistered and buffeted unbaffled still ever the snare was set ever in vain the lotus island and the siren strain through scylla and charybdis hath he run sleepless plunging to the setting sun who hath so suffered or so far hath sailed so much encountered and so much quailed which is exactly the kind of poetry one requires for the cavern scene of a new year's pantomime possibly again the real true english poet is mr william watson with his tiresome mimicry of wordsworth and his high and dry style of lyrical architecture mr watson is believed to have done great things but his role now appears to be one of austere silence he is what the old writers would have termed a costive poet and if his collected poems are to be the end of him his end will not be long deferred or possibly the one and only poet our england of to-day would wish to boast is mr arthur simons mr simons writes just the kind of poetry one might expect of a versifier who in early youth had loved a cigarette-smoking ballet girl and could never bring himself to repress his passion here is a sample of mr arthur simons at his choicest the feverish room and that white bed the tumble skirts upon a chair the novel flung half opened where hat hairpins puffs and paints are spread and you half dressed and half awake your slant eyes strangely watching me and i who watch you drowsily with eyes that having slept not ache this uh, need one dread nay dare one hope will rise a ghost of memory if ever again my handkerchief is scented with white heliotrope no doubt if the english continue to descend the moral avernus at their present rate of speed mr simons will become by sheer process of time the representative poet of the nation it is part of a poet's duty to look into the future and mr simons appears to have taken the next two or three generations of englishmen by the forelock may he have the reward which is his due for the rest they all mean well and they all aim high but one is afraid that nothing will come of them there are francis thompson and lawrence hausman and henry newbolt and lawrence binion and f b manicutz and arthur christopher benson and victor parr amiable performers all but each a standing example of poetical shortcoming perhaps one ought not to mention mr john davidson and mr w b yeats because mr davidson is a scot and mr yeats putatively at any rate an irishman 
in some respects these twain may be considered the pick of the basket i am constrained to admit however that neither of them has as yet fulfilled his earlier promise so that on the whole england is practically without poets of marked or extraordinary attainments the reason is not far to seek she is losing the breed of noble bloods her greed her luxuriousness her excesses her contempt for all but the material are beginning to find her out her youths who should be fired by the brightest emotions are bidden not to be fools and taught that the whole duty of man is to be washed and combed and financially successful consequently that section of english adolescence which in the nature of things begins with poetry and gladness very speedily throws up the sponge consecration to the muse is no longer thought of among englishmen they cannot be content to be published and take their chance the dismal shibboleth of poetry does not pay wears them all down what is the good of writing verses which bring you neither reputation nor emolument one must live and to live like a gentleman by honest toil and devote one's leisure instead of one's life to poetry is the better part meanwhile england jogs along quite comfortably she can get keats for a shilling and shakespeare for sixpence why should she worry herself for a moment with the new men end of chapter eleven chapter twelve fiction after much patient thinking the english have come to the conclusion that there is but one branch of literary art and that its name is fiction and by fiction the english really mean the six-shilling novel i do not think it too much to say that since the six-shilling novel was first thrust upon our delighted attention it has never brought within its covers six shillings worth of reading the high priest and high priestess who serve to the right and left of the altar of six shillingism are as every one knows mr hall Caine and miss marie corelli each of them wears a golden ephod with a breastplate of jewels arranged to spell out the magic figures one hundred thousand all the other priests of the tabernacle look with awe and envy upon these two because the other priests breastplates have hard work to spell out fifty thousand and some of them do not even achieve one thousand five hundred burnt offerings of cain and corelli therefore fill the place with savour a pair of sorrier writers never was on sea or land everybody knows it nobody denies it and nobody seems sad about it the six-shilling novel is an established english institution cain and corelli are its prop and stay and the rest do their best to keep in the running and pick up the minor money-bags the perusal of six-shilling fiction is practically a sort of mania it has seized in its grip the fairest england has to show particularly matrons the younger women and stockbrokers for the englishwoman the daily round would lose its saltness did she not have handy the newest six-shilling novel by mr Kane, miss corelli or the next literary baller in the market-place there are shops called libraries to which the englishwoman repairs for her supplies of literary pabulum here the six-shilling novel has a great time strapped together in sixes or packed in boxes of dozens it is handed forth to the carriages of its fair devourers and taken right away to its repose in the cultured homes of bayswater and Kensington. from morning till night many englishwomen do little but read this precious stuff what they get out of it amounts in the long run to hysteria and anemia it brings about a general deadening of the mind and a general jaggedness of the emotions coupled with an utter incapacity to take any save an exaggerated view of the facts of life discontent disillusionment ennui boredom ill-temper a sharp tongue and a cynical spirit are other symptoms which the six-shilling novel is prone to evoke the habit is worse than opium or hashish or tea cigarettes it is just the devil and that is all you need say about it the persons employed in the opium traffic are supposed to be very wicked to my mind the persons employed in the fiction traffic are as wicked as wicked can be when the foul disease began first to make its ravages obvious there were not wanting persons who would have checked it and provided remedies for it 
these persons squeaked somewhat and nothing more has been heard of them so the thing goes on unrestrained and even applauded by press and pulpit alike and the Englishwoman has become a confirmed, inveterate, and incurable fiction reader. If a man have an enemy to whom he would do an abiding injury, let him persuade that enemy to obtain the six more popular six-shilling novels of the moment and read them through. If the man's enemy sticks to his bargain, at which, however, he will probably shy in the middle of the second volume, the chances are that he gets up from that reading a broken and spiritless man. His brain will be as saggy as a sponge full of treacle, and his vision as unreliable as that of the alcoholist, who always saw two cabs and invariably got into the one that was not there." seriously however what is there about this english fiction or for that matter about scottish fiction that men and women should buy it and devour it to the exclusion of all other literary fare it is ill-written it is not original it is not like life it is not beautiful it is not inspiring it does not touch the profound emotions it means nothing and it ends nowhere the reason of its popularity is that it appeals to an indolent habit of mind and as a general rule is calculated to excite the passions and particularly to open up questions which experience has shown to be best left alone in nine cases out of ten where a popular work of fiction is concerned it is always possible to put one's finger on the chapter or passages on which its popularity is based and in nine cases out of ten that chapter or those passages have to do with sexual matters the questions which arise out of the relation of man and woman are no doubt vitally important and most interesting but that they should be discussed in an unscientific irresponsible and catchpenny way by anybody who can trail a pen is something of a scandal if an author can succeed in inventing a sexual situation which could not by any possible chance exist for a moment in real life or if he can put a glow and a gloss on the triteness of love and lust his success as a fictionist is to all intents and purposes assured what is sometimes spoken of as wholesome fiction scarcely exists anyway nobody reads it it is the carefully constructed book about sex that sells and is read such a book need not be flagrant as was once thought to be the case it can be a work of art a thing of veiled suggestion delicate unobjectionable and seemingly meet to be read one has hesitation in asserting that such books ought not to be written or ought not to be circulated it is difficult to justify any attitude of intolerance in such a matter yet the fact remains that the maids and matrons of england together with the men who have the leisure and sufficient lack of brains to read fiction are being stuffed season by season and year by year with about the most undesirable kind of sexual philosophy that could well be placed before them of any englishwoman of the leisured class above the age of sixteen years it may be said as was said of the late professor jowett in a different sense what i don't know isn't knowledge and the instructor in all cases is a fictionist if a man took his notion of business or politics or art out of six-shilling novels he would be set down for a fool yet most english women get their view of love and the married relation from these extraordinary works and it is taken for granted that nobody is a penny the worse for my own part i should incline to the opinion that the only persons who are a penny not to say six shillings the worse are the english middle and upper classes as a body much has been said in derision of what the english call the kelliard school of fiction kelliard fiction being i need scarcely say a brand of fiction written by scotsmen usually in scotland and sold in the english and the american markets everybody of taste and judgment cheerfully admits that kelliarders are not persons of genius for the delectation of the southerner they have made a scotland of their own the which however is not scotland they have made a scottish sentiment a scottish point of view a scottish humour a scottish pathos and even a scottish dialect which may be reckoned quite doubtful 
at the same time one looks in vain to the kale-yarders for anything that is worse than slobber anything really noxious and dreadful that is to say one might read kale-yard forever and a day without coming to great moral grief indeed i would point out that on the whole the kailyard system of ethics partakes somewhat of the character of the system of ethics which used to be unfolded in the melodrama of our grandfather's days virtue rewarded vice punished is the moral upshot of it and in any case and let it be as bad and as meretricious and as greatly to be deprecated as one will we must always remember that the kailyard book is a work invented and manufactured not for scotsmen but for the anglo-saxon the englishman and his offshoots some months back a considerable hubbub arose in english literary circles because m jules verne had been saying to an interviewer at amiens of all places in the world that the novel as a form of literary expression was doomed and would gradually die out of popular favour it is safe to say that in the eyes of sundry critics of pretty well every nationality the novel has been doomed any time this last fifty years yet the novel comes up smiling every time since it was reduced in price to six shillings in england it has undoubtedly deteriorated not only as a piece of writing but also in the matter of ethical intention so long as it remains the prey of some of its latter-day exploiters so long will it continue to deteriorate so long as the english mind continues to be feeble and unwholesome and yearn for artificial thrills and undesirable emotions so long will english fiction continue to be of its present decadent quality as the capitalist says it is all a question of supply and demand the great aim of writers of fiction or at any rate of ninety nine per cent of them is to produce an article that will sell you must turn out what the public want and they will assuredly buy it the knack of hitting the public taste looks easy to acquire and the fictionist strives after it with all his might many are called to make fortunes out of novel writing few are chosen but nobody can examine the work of those few without perceiving that for weal or woe principally for woe they know their business of course it goes without saying that a very considerable amount of fiction is published in england which is just as mild and just as innocuous as tinned milk to this puling variety of fiction however the english do not appear to be very greatly drawn it crops up with great regularity every publishing season it is solemnly reviewed in the critical journals and it even stands shoulder by shoulder with stronger meat in the bookshops but the fact remains that it does not sell. To see second edition on it is the rarest occurrence. In fine, the English will have their fiction spiced and highly spiced, or not at all. Mealy-mouthed writers, over-reticent, over-blushful, over-austere writers, they do not want. Neither have they any admiration for a writer who is plagued with a feeling for style, and who may be reckoned an artist in the collocation of words. Their much-vaunted Meredith has never had the sale of a Crockett or a Barry or a Hawking, or for that matter of a J. K. Jerome. The English have little or no literary taste, little or no literary acumen, and they expect their fictionists to give them anything and everything save what is edifying end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen suburbanism of old that is to say twenty years ago the great majority of the english people suffered from a mental and general disability which was termed provincialism if you hailed from manchester or liverpool or birmingham or edinburgh or glasgow the kind gentlemen in london who sized people up and put them in their places assured you that you were a provincial and that you would have to rub shoulders a great deal with the world by which they meant london before you could rightly consider yourself qualified to exist 
against the epithet provincial however not a few persons rebelled when it was applied flatly to themselves most men of feeling felt hurt when you called them provincial in the world of letters and journalism to call a man provincial was the last and unkindest cut of all and it usually settled him just to say that he has no sense of humour settles him to-day then up rose thomas carlyle and robert buchanan and a few lesser lights who said you call us provincials provincials we undoubtedly are and we glory in the character this rather baffled not to say amazed the lily-fingered london assessors and gradually the term provincial as a term of opprobrium passed out of use it is admitted now on all hands that the provincial is a very useful kind of fellow and when the metropolis feels itself running short of talent and energy the provincial is invariably invited to look in laterally however the londoner and the dweller in english provincial cities have begun to exhibit a distinctly modern disorder which may be called for want of a better term suburbanism in london which may be taken as the type of all english cities suburbanism is pretty well rampant it has its origin in what the americans would call location a man's daily work lies say in the city or in the central quarters of london for various reasons such as for example as considerations of health expenditure and custom it is practically impossible for him to live near his work he must live somewhere so he goes to balham or tooting or clapham or bronsbury or highgate or willesden or finchley or couch end or hampstead or some other suburban retreat london is ringed round with these residential quarters these little towns outside the walls a visitor to any one of them is at once struck with its striking and painful similarity to all the others there is a railway station belonging to one of the metropolitan lines there is a high street fronted with lofty and rather gaudy shops there is a reasonable sprinkling of churches and chapels there is a brand new red brick theatre and the rest is row on row and row on row of villa residences each with its dreary palisading and attenuated grass plot in front and its curious annex of kitchen or scullery behind miles and miles of these villas exist in every metropolitan suburb worthy the name and though the rents and sizes of them may vary they are all built to one architectural formula and all pinchbeck ostentatious and unlovely no person of judgment nobody possessed of a ray of the philosophic spirit can gaze upon them without concluding at once that the english do not know how to live take a street of these villas big or little and what do you find you note first that nearly every house be it occupied by clerk jew financier or professional man has got a highfalutin name of its own the county council or local authority has already bestowed upon it a number but this is not enough for your suburbanist who must needs appropriate for his house a name which will look swagger on his letter-box hence number two sandringham road tooting is not number two sandringham road tooting at all but the laurels if you please number four not to be outdone is holmwood number six is hazel dean number eight the pines number ten sutherland house and so forth then again if you walk down a street and keep your eye on the front windows of this thoroughfare of mansions you will note that every one of those windows has cheap lace curtains to it and that immediately behind the centre of the window there is a little table upon which loving hands have placed a green high art vase containing a plant of sorts and right back in the dimness of the parlour there is a sideboard with a high mirrored back if you made acquaintance with half a dozen of the occupiers of these houses and were invited into the half dozen front rooms you would find in each in addition to the sideboard before mentioned a piano of questionable manufacture a brass music-stool with a red velvet cushion an overmantel with mirrored panels a saddle-bag suite consisting of ladies and gents and six ordinary chairs and a couch 
a center table with a velvet pile cloth upon it a bamboo bookcase containing a carelli and a hall crane or so together with some sixpenny dickenses picked up at draper's bargain sales nuttall's dictionary mrs beaton's house book a bible a prayer book some hymn books a work-basket full of socks waiting to be darned and a little pile of music chiefly pirated at night when spriggs comes home to the laurels he has an apology for late dinner gets into his slippers and retires with mrs spriggs and perhaps his elder daughter into that parlor there he reads a halfpenny newspaper till there is nothing left in it to read then he talks to mrs spriggs about that beast so-and-so his employer and mrs spriggs tells him not to grumble so much and asks the elder daughter why she doesn't play a tune to liven us up a bit yes says spriggs what is the good of having a piano and me buying you music every saturday if you never play whereupon the elder daughter rattles through dolly gray the honeysuckle and the bee and everybody's loved by some one and spriggs beats time with his foot till he grows weary and thinks we had better have supper and get off to bed this kind of thing is going on right down both sides of sandringham road at homewood at hazeldean at the pines and at sutherland house as well as at the laurels every weekday evening between the hours of eight and midnight in point of fact it is going on all over tooting it is the suburban notion of an happy evening at home and hallowed as it is by wont and custom everybody in tooting takes it to be the best that life can offer after business hours perhaps it is just before supper or haply a little afterwards however spriggs says that he believes he will take a little stroll round the houses he puts on a straw hat in summer and a tweed cap in winter and proceeds gravely down the sandringham road until he reaches a break in the long array of villas and is aware of a rather flaring public-house into the saloon bar of this hostelry he walks staidly nods to the company and asks the barmaid for a drop of the usual let me see says that sweet lady johnny walker isn't it well you know it is says spriggs as he hands over threepence with the glass of whiskey in his hand he retires to the nearest red plush settee and looks listlessly at the illustrated papers on the little table in front of him drinks somewhat slowly smokes a pipe exchanges a word about the weather with the landlord of the establishment says there's time for another before closing time has another and at twelve thirty trots off home the seven or eight other men in the saloon bar being respectively the occupiers of homewood hazeldean the pines sutherland houses etc have done almost exactly as spriggs has done in the way of drinks and nods and illustrated papers and having a final at twenty minutes past twelve but during the whole evening they have not exchanged a rational word with one another they have nothing to talk about therefore they have not talked they are neighbors and they know it but they all hold themselves to be so much superior to one another that they have scorned to speak to each other except in the most cursory and casual way next morning at a few minutes to nine o'clock they will all be scooting anxiously along the sandringham road with set faces damp brows and a fear in their hearts that they are going to miss their train they will travel in packed carriages half of them standing up while the other half growls to ludgate hill or moorgate street as the case may be and then rush off again to their respective offices in fear and trembling this time lest they should be three minutes late and the governor might notice it this is the life of the males in the sandringham road year in and year out through living in the same houses in the midst of the same furniture listening to the same pianos drinking at the same public houses going to business in the same trains they become as like one another as peas they are all anxious all dull all short of sleep all short of money in brief they have become suburbanized the monotony and snobbery and listlessness of their home life are reflected in their conduct of the working day's affairs there is not a man amongst them who has a soul above his job each of them sticks at business not because he loves it or likes it but simply because he knows that if he were discovered in a remissness he would get what he calls the sack 
each of them lunches oh this english lunch at the bar of a public house on a glass of bitter beer and a penny welsh rarebit each of them feels a bit chippy and not a little sleepy of an afternoon and each of them races for his train in the evening chock full of worry and bad temper you must live in the suburbs if you are to live in london at all and there is no escape from it the lines of the female suburbians are cast in more or less pleasant places they do not need to go to town every day there are shops galore filled with just the goods they want round the corner and there is always the next female on both sides to gossip with for unlike the male suburbian the female suburbian will talk to her neighbours her conversation is of babes and butcher's meat and the peace at the theatre and the bargains at the stores in the high road and him he or him means the good lady's husband she never by any chance refers to him either by his christian name or his surname or as my husband it is always he said to me this morning or as i was saying to him before he went to business which i take it is a peculiarly english habit the female suburbian goes out to tea sometimes usually at the house of some suburban relative her dress is a curious blend of ostentation and economy she will be in the fashion and being an englishwoman expense is no object providing she can get the money she has no notion of thrift she is perennially in arrears with the milk and the insurance man and when money gets very tight indeed she lectures her husband on his wicked inability to make more than he is getting the whole life whether for male or female is dreary harried unrelieved and destructive of everything that tends to make life affable and tolerable in view of the obvious evils suburbanism has brought about in the english metropolis it might have been expected that the english provincial cities would have done their best to avoid similar troubles in their own areas so far from this being the case however the craze for suburbanism is making itself apparent wherever one turns city and borough councils lead the way by erecting at the public expense artisans and clerks dwellings well out of the town they hold that fresh air the open country and cheap railway fares are all that is wanted to make the english citizen's life a perennial joy to him yet the dwellings they erect are of the shoddiest and least homelike kind the fresh air which is to do the worker and the children so much good is a doubtful quantity and the cheap railway fares are bragged about without regard to the time taken up in travelling and the hurry and anxiety to catch trains suburbanism as a stereotyped and soul-deadening institution is of purely english origin in no other country in the world do convention and what other people will say so rule the lives of men as they do in england suburban is in many ways the most obvious of the many products of english convention it is at once an indication of brainlessness want of intelligence and incipient decay apparently there is to be no limit to it outside london new suburbs spring up almost weekly but their newness brings no changes in its strain each new suburb is mapped out and built exactly on the lines of the old ones each is destined for the reception of exactly the same kind of stupid people each will be the living ground of generations of people still more stupid End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen the man about town the english man about town and i am not acquainted with any other sort is to put it mildly a devil of a fellow who he may be how he gets a living whether he gets a living how and why he became a man about town and whether after all he is really a man about town are matters which are wrapped in mystery everybody knows him yet nobody knows much about him you meet him everywhere yet nobody can tell you how he gets there his acquaintance is astonishing ranging from dustmen to dukes as it were he cuts nobody though he is intimate with nobody he is familiar with his world and all that it expects of him and he plays the game skilfully correctly and as gentlemen should 
there are droves of him in london probably no other city in the world could with comfort accommodate so many of him he lives in the sun he is the joy and pride of the restaurateurs and the cafe keepers hearts no billiard room is complete without him he shines at bars of onyx music halls and theatres could not get on without him and on the whole it is his useful and pleasing function to keep the west end of london and its offshoots going what the west end of london means to the man about town is a large question it means clubs in the morning with a tailor a hatter a bookmaker or two thrown in it means expensive lunches lazy somnolent afternoon big dinners hard drinking cards night clubs and a day that ends at three o'clock in the morning nobody but an englishman could stand the racket nobody but an englishman could find satisfaction in so doing the man about town is the last expression of an unhealthy plutocracy he is the child of means the son of his father the pampered darling of his mother and he has never understood that life was anything more than a frivolous holiday whether he has money or happens to have spent it all he sets the standard of expenditure for everybody who would be considered in the movement he also sets the fashion in hats coats trousers fancy waistcoats shoes walking sticks and scarf pins for englishmen at large it never occurs to him that he does this but he does it he it is who is the prime supporter and patron of the manly english sports horse racing glove fighting coaching moting polo shooting fishing yachting and so forth in these exercises he finds great delight when he is not busy dining and whining and painting the town red sport is the mainstay of his existence he is usually young till he reaches the age of thirty when he begins to decline rapidly but the older he gets the younger he gets although he may lose his hair and be compelled to have resort to false teeth and elastic stockings his spirits are invariably of the cheerfulest his laugh is boisterous his interest in life acute and he continues to be passionately fond of food and drink it is not till his locks become hoar his purse well nigh empty and the number of his years well over threescore and ten that he begins to droop englishmen will point him out to you in cafes and say with hushed voices you see that man the one with the frowsy beard and his hat a-tilt well he spent a hundred and fifty thousand twice a hundred and fifty thousand my boy what did he do with it oh well what do people do with money there's a man sir that seen life used to have a house in berkeley square has owned three derby winners built the thingamabob theatre for miss jumping about knows everybody has hobnobbed with the king when he was prince of wales used to be hand in glove with the duke of blank and that crowd and now damn he hasn't a penny piece all this with the air of a person who is showing you something worth seeing it is the english fatuity first of all to admire the man who is possessed of wealth secondly to admire a man who is throwing his money away and thirdly to look with respectful awe upon the man who has thrown it away it warms the english heart and fires the english imagination to see the son of a recently deceased provision dealer playing the prince at the best hotels plunging at ascot and monte carlo buying up the stalls at the frivolity at the behest of lotte flutterfest and generally flinging to the winds the hard-earned and to a great extent ill-gotten estate of his late lamented parent by all the best people by all the best english people that is to say such a youth is received and made welcome if not exactly taken to the bosom englishmen ask him to dinner simply because he has money they are aware that his courses will not bear examination that his tastes are gross that his intellect is none of the brightest he has nothing to say for himself he is neither entertaining nor amusing nor instructive the englishman has no ulterior motive upon him he does not hope to get him into this or that financial swim neither does he desire to marry his daughter to him he simply feels that it is well to be friendly with money and the man about town even a bankrupt or broke man about town is better to the englishman than none at all with such a person he will foregather and be pleasant in the sight of all men old so-and-so he says is a dear old sort 
he is broke of course and sometimes he rather worries one for sovereigns but i have never deserted a pal in adversity in my life and i'm not going to begin with old so-and-so thus your good snob englishman would lead you to believe that he was on terms of intimacy and affection with old so-and-so in old so-and-so's palmy money-squandering days whereas in point of fact he never clapped eyes on the man till he had spent his last farthing it is all very english and to a mere scot a trifle astonishing the scot if i know him at all takes no joys of spendthrifts however prettily dressed and least of all can he be brought to court the society of a man who has reduced himself to beggary by extravagance and riot the bare gift of prodigality and the bare reputation of having been wealthy are nothing to the scot if he wants men to admire he can find men of solider quality the englishman on the other hand has no great love for either solidity or worth the first makes him envious the second bores him though he may himself be a person of judgment and sober life he likes to have about him men who are going or who have gone the whole hog and who pursue their pleasures without restraint remorse or fear hence the man about town will always figure interestingly in english society there is a romance about him he has been foolish and perhaps even wicked but he belongs to the select coterie of people who when all is said make the gay world go round End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 Drink Mr. Crossland has very kindly suggested that under the inspiring tutelage of the National Bard, Scotland has become one of the drunkenest nations in the world. I shall not retaliate as one might do, but shall content myself by referring the reader to the easily accessible tables of statistics, which render it quite plain that Scotland's drunkenness is very considerably exceeded by the drunkenness of England. In London, at any rate, strong drink flows like a river. There are 5,300 licensed houses in the metropolitan area alone in kilburn a suburb of more or less irreproachable respectability there are twenty-five churches and chapels and thirty-five public houses during late years public house property has begun to be looked upon in the light of a gilt-edged investment turn where one will one finds the older inns are being swept away while on their sites are erected flaring gin palaces with plate-glass fronts elaborate mahogany fitments gorgeous saloon and private bars painted ceilings inlaid floors and electric lights throughout behind the bar instead of mine host of a former day and his wife and daughter there are half a dozen perked-up barmaids with rouged cheeks and a rosetti hair and a person called the manager who for two pounds a week runs the place for its proprietors a limited company which owns perhaps twenty or thirty other houses in the conduct of these mammoth drinking places three great points are kept in view namely that a quick drinking stand-up trade pays better than any amount of slow regular custom that the english drinker of the lower class cannot tell the difference between good drink and bad often preferring indeed the bad to the good and that as bad liquor is cheaper than good the sound commercial thing to do is to supply bad liquor with these admirable axioms continually before it the english trade has prospered amazingly more drink and worse drink is sold in england to-day than has ever been sold in england before through legislation intended to ensure sound liquor and the proper conduct of licensed houses the proprietors have consistently made a point of driving the usual brewer's dray in order to meet the food and drug adulteration act all spirits sold at this establishment while of the same excellent quality as heretofore are diluted according to strength the same excellent quality as heretofore is choice and so is diluted according to strength as for the beer we dilute also the beer according to strength 
when we are caught at it it is a mistake on the part of the cellarman who has been discharged and the fine is so small in proportion to the profit on selling water that we smile at the back of our necks and keep on diluting according to strength our whole system in fact is designed to make people drink and to make them drink the worst that we dare put before them now the scot drunkard or no drunkard does have something of a taste in liquor the best clarets have gone to scotland in spite of mr crossland since claret became a dinner wine you cannot put off a scot with either bad whisky or bad beer he knows what whisky should be and what beer should be and in scotland at any rate he never has any difficulty in getting them but the english taking them in the mass are quite the other way any sort of wine provided it be properly fortified and sophisticated passes with them for the real thing their scotch whisky is about the most wholesome thing they drink but large quantities of this are bought by english merchants in a crude state and rammed down the public throat without a thought to maturing blending and otherwise rendering the spirit potable english beer we have been told in song and story is the finest beer in the world yet nobody can visit an english brewery without discovering that english beer is not english beer at all glucose in the place of malt cassia and gentian in the place of hops finings in the place of storage are the universal order and so depraved and perverted has the fine old english taste in beer become that brewers who have set up to provide an honest article and sent it out to their customers have had it returned with the curt comment that nobody would drink such hogwash and what the customers wanted was beer and not brewer's apron every now and again scares crop up in consequence of the use of improper ingredients there is an inquiry a royal commission and the englishman still goes on stolidly drinking arsenic will not drive him away from his favourite tipple neither will coculus indicus or any of the round dozen abominations upon which the brewer's chemist makes his stand if there is one thing more than another that is considered the chief necessity of life in the english household of the poorer class it is beer and its sister beverage porter from morning till night the can is continually going between the house of the artisan and the neighbouring public the first thing in the morning the artisan himself must have a couple of goes of rum and milk by eleven o'clock he is ready for a pint of four half at noon when he knocks off for dinner he will imbibe a quarter more of the same beverage and at night after work he sits in the tap-room till closing time and drinks as much as ever he can pay for or chalk up meanwhile his wife must have her drop of porter in the morning her drop of bitter to dinner and her drop of something hot before going to bed also on saturday afternoons when the twain go marketing together they must have a few drinks just to show there is no ill feeling while on saturday night the artisan not infrequently improves the shining hours by getting blind to use his own elegant phrase thus it quite commonly happens that a third and even a half of the total income of a household of the artisan class is spent in alcohol thrift provision for a rainy day and for old age become an impossibility underfeeding usually walks hand in hand with overdrinking the man loses his nerve the woman her comeliness and her capacity and the end is pauperism and a pauper's grave if nothing worse among the english middle and upper classes there is distinctly a greater tendency to moderation than among the lower classes for all that the middle classes especially can point to a great many brilliant examples of the fine art of soaking publicans betting men commercial travellers proprietors of businesses solicitors clerks journalists and the like get through an amount of drinking in the course of a day which would probably appall even themselves if they kept an account of it let's have a drink is invariably one of the first phrases dropped when two englishmen meet we'll have another is sure to follow and so is hang it man we must have a final among the middle classes too as also among the upper classes 
there is a very great deal of secret drinking particularly among women and persons whose professional or official positions necessitate the maintenance of an appearance of extreme respectability the grocer's license and his fine stock of carefully selected wines and spirits offer a ready means of supply to the female dipsomaniac who would not be seen in a public house for worlds besides gin can be charged as tea in a grocery account and many a bottle of brandy has figured in such accounts under the innocent pseudonym of rolled ox tongue though the english upper classes as i have said drink with a certain moderation their moderation really embraces a quantity of liquor which would send the artisan quite off its head whiskies and sodas at noon burgundy at lunch with cognac to one's coffee three kinds of wine at dinner followed by liqueurs and whiskey make no appreciable mark on a man who is living at his ease and can sleep as long as he likes but the sum total of alcohol is quite considerable and probably greater than that consumed by the drunken sot for whom my lord has such contempt of english drinking generally one may remark that it is done in a very deliberate and unsociable way the english cannot be said to drink for company's sake they do not foregather and carry on their drinking merrily in their cups they are neither witty nor happy but just dull and dour and inclined to be quarrelsome they drink for drinking's sake for the sake of intoxication and to drown trouble i wish them good luck and less of their vile concoctions chapter sixteen food the subject of diet he prefers to call it diet is apparently one of unlimited interest to the englishman meet him where you will he is ever ready to discuss first the weather and then the things that is to say the kinds of food that agree with him indeed you could almost stake your life on extracting from any strange englishman you happen to come across some such statement as i can't abide eggs or veal always makes me bilious within ten minutes of opening up a conversation with him the englishman's house we are told is his castle and the englishman's hobby surely is his digestion in point of fact ninety nine per cent of adolescent and adult english people suffer from chronic indigestion in a more or less severe form flatulence heartburn colic and liver are the englishman's mortal heritage he is invariably troubled with some of them and quite commonly with all if you relieved him of them he would scarcely thank you because he has nursed them from his youth up and what he really wants is amelioration and not cure probably this is the reason why in the midst of his wails and his unholy talk about diet he continues to feed in precisely the grossest greasiest and least rational manner that generations of bad feeders have been able to develop of mornings if you sojourn with an english family you will be invited to breakfast at half-past eight promptly at that hour they serve a sort of sickly oatmeal soup compounded apparently of milk and sugar which they call porridge then follow thick and piping hot coffee with ham and eggs fish or a chop and bread and butter and marmalade as a sort of wind-up the man who tackles this menu goes to business belching like a torn balloon by eleven o'clock however he is ready for a little snack oysters and chablis prawns on toast a mouthful of bread and cheese and a bottle of bass or something of that kind then at half-past one there is lunch practically a dinner of several courses or a cut from the joint accompanied by what the english euphoniously term to veg at tea-time your englishman must needs lave himself in a dish of orange pico or bohia to the accompaniment of lumps of cake and at long and last comes dinner the crowning guzzle of the englishman's day and a function usually spread over a couple of hours it will be perceived that this gustatory programme or routine has been copied from the french the french put away two good meals per diem one at noon and the other in the evening and there is no reason why the english should not do the same when you come to think of it dinner in the middle of the day is a low underbred undistinguished arrangement also not to dine at night is to run the risk of not losing one's figure and of having the neighbours say that one cannot afford it 
the french programme would be all very well if it were carried out on french lines all through but it is not when you say soup in a french restaurant it means that you will be served with half a dozen tablespoonfuls of consomme or petit marmite or bisque as the case may be when the englishman says soup he means enough thick stock to wash a bus down what is more he gets it and swallows it and it is so all down the menu too much of everything and don't you think you can put me off with your blooming homeopathic portions a liberal table no stent good food and plenty of it is one of the bulwarks of english respectability that bad digestion and talks about diet follow is nobody's fault this profusion this over food as it were has been brought to its noblest expression by the english aristocracy whose tables literally groan with costly viands whose spits are always turning and whose scullions and kitchen wenches are as an army it is related that when a certain duke found it necessary to retrench and was advised by his family solicitor to get rid of his fifth sixth and seventh cooks his grace remarked but so-and-so a man must have biscuit the english middle class of course faithfully imitates to the best of its powers the english upper class and so on through the grades among all classes there is a rooted prejudice against food that happens to be cheap to this day people who eat a scallop are rather looked down upon for no other reason than that oysters run you into half a crown a dozen while you can get excellent escallops at ninepence so the herring the whiting and other brands of cheap fish are considered little better than offal by persons who can afford to pay for sole and salmon turtle soup is infinitely to be preferred to any other soup in the world because it is dearer and champagne is drunk not because people like it but because it looks swagger and testifies to the possession of means these gustatory idiosyncrasies are purely english and obviously they are the offspring of the english love of display and superfluity among the lower classes the general feeding though cheaper is just as wasteful and just as gross excluding bread it consists chiefly of inferior cuts of butcher's meat with charcuterie and dried fish thrown in it has been complained against the scot that he is none too clean a feeder delighting hugely in inferior meats haggis is held forth as a great exemplar in point but it cannot be denied that throughout england the one kind of emporium for the sale of comestibles which flourishes and is unfailingly popular is the pork or ham and beef shop and here what do you obtain why exactly the meats which gentlemen of the type of mr henley describe as awful they include in addition to pork in and out of season pig's feet pig's heads pig's liver and kidneys pig's blood sausages the savoury duck or a mess of seasoned remnants tripe boiled and raw and chitterlings so that the haggis of scotland is fairly well balanced i am not suggesting for a moment that the english display other than a proper judgment in devouring these dainties but if they will favour the pork shop and its contents they can scarcely expect to be set down for an angel bread and manna eating people perhaps the chief scandal about english feeding lies in the condition of the english hotels on the continent an hotel is an establishment for the accommodation of travellers requiring food and rest in england an hotel is an establishment for the accommodation of landlords and waiters high-class cuisine says the tariff card also wines and spirits of the best selected quality yet one's experience tells one that though the bill will be heavy neither the cuisine nor the wines will be more than passable much less high class a menu which is the same yesterday to-day and forever bad cooking careless service and a general lack of finish are the things one may expect at an english hotel with the tolerable certainty of not being disappointed to complain is to draw forth the ill-disguised contempt of bibulous head-waiters and the stiff apologies of haughty proprietors but beyond that mortal man will never get because the english hotel is an immemorial and conservative institution and as wise in its own conceit as the ancient sphinx 
of late and in london attempts have been made to organize hotels adapted to the best kind of requirements so far as i am aware only two of them have really succeeded and the charges at both places are quite prohibitive closely identified one might almost say affiliated to the english hotel is the english railway buffet of which so much has been said in song and story the sheer horribleness of the refreshments here provided has passed into a proverb the english themselves admit that if you wish to know the worst about refreshments you should drink the railway buffet tea and partake of the railway buffet sandwich they also admit that for abominations in the way of aerated waters milk beer and whiskey pastry cakes hard-boiled eggs cold meats boiled chicken and ham and chops and steaks from the grill the railway buffet takes the palm and they admit further that the hebes who dispense these comestibles to the hungry and howling mob have the manners of duchesses yet the english without their railway buffets would be an utterly woebegone and miserable people put an englishman down at a strange railway station with a half-hour wait before him he has but one resort he inquires right off for the buffet and there he gorges and swizzles till the warning bell advises him of the departure of his train if there is no buffet he becomes a dejected pallid man and threatens to write to the newspapers so long as the railway buffets continue to exist the english digestion can never aspire to perfection even though english feeding and cooking outside railway stations become ideal for a single meal of railway buffet viands would permanently disorganize the digestive capabilities of the most ostrichy ostrich that ever walked on two legs End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen law and order the english love to be ruled just as eels are said to take delight in being skinned they hold that a nation which is properly ruled cannot fail of happiness. Their notion of rule may be summed up in the phrase, law and order. The Englishman believes that law and order are heaven-sent blessings, especially invented for his behoof. Where else in the world, he will ask you grandiloquently, do you get such law and order as you get in England, the land of the free? If anybody picks his pocket, or encroaches upon his land, or infringes his patent rights, or diverts his watercourses, the Englishman knows exactly what to do. There is the law. They keep it on tap in great buildings called courts, and persons in wigs serve out to you precisely what you may deserve with great gusto and solemnity. The man picked your pocket, did he? Three months' imprisonment for the man. Somebody is making colorable imitations of your patent doll's eyes? Well, you can apply for an injunction. And so on. This is law. All Englishmen believe in it, particularly those who have never had any. When it comes to the worst, and the Englishman finds that he really must take on a little of his own beautiful specific, he usually begins by falling into something of a flutter those bewigged and sedate persons seated in great chairs with bouquets in front of them and policemen to bawl silence for them begin to have a new meaning for the englishman hitherto he has regarded them complacently as the bodily representatives of the law in a free country he has smacked his lips over them rejoiced in their learning wit and acumen warmed at the notion of their dignity and thanked god that he belonged to a free people free england now when it comes to a trifling personal encounter before this mountain of dignity this mountain of dignity perched on a mountain of precedent as it were the englishman shivers and looks pale but his solicitor and his counsel and his counsel's clerk particularly his counsel's clerk soon put him at his ease and instead of withdrawing at the feel of the bath he is fain to plump right in whether he comes out on top or gets beaten is another matter in any case the trouble about the thing is that win or lose it is infinitely and appallingly costly law the englishman's birthright is not to be given away 
if you want any you must pay for it and pay for it handsomely too otherwise you can go without the english adage to the effect that there is one law for the rich and another for the poor is one of those adages which are very subtly true there is a law for the rich certainly there is also a law for the poor namely no law at all on the whole the englishman who has not had his pristine dream of english law shattered by contact with the realities is to be envied all other englishmen whether their experience has lain in county courts high courts or courts of appeal talk lovingly of english law with their tongues in their cheeks with respect to order the much bepraised handmaiden of law i do not think that the english get half so much of her as they think they do she costs them a pretty penny the upkeep of her police and magistrates and general myrmidons runs the englishman into some noble taxation yet where shall you find an english community that is orderly if even an infinitesimal section of it has made up its mind to be otherwise in london at the present moment there are whole districts which it is not safe for a decently dressed person to traverse even in broad daylight and these districts are not by any means slum districts but parts of the metropolis in which lie important arteries of traffic there is not a square mile of the metropolitan area which does not boast its organized gang of daylight robbers purse snatchers watch snatchers and bullies who would beat a man insensible for fourpence and whose great weapon is the belt for convenience sake these people have been grouped together under the term hooligan the police the far-famed london police can do nothing with them they admit that they are ineradicable and irrepressible the magistrates and the newspapers keep on asseverating that something must be done that something apparently consists in the capture of a stray specimen of the tribe who is forthwith given three months with perhaps a little whipping thrown in but hooliganism is a business that continues to flourish like the green bay-leaf and london is no safer to-day than it was in the time of the garroters as the belt is the weapon of the london robber and as hooligan is his name so we find in all the larger provincial towns gangs of scoundrels with special instruments and slang names of their own in lancashire and the black country kicking appears to be the favorite method of dealing with the order-loving citizen in some of the northern towns the knuckle-duster the sandbag, and the loaded stick are requisitioned and in all cases we are told the police are powerless the fact is that on the whole england cannot be reckoned an orderly country the hooligans and their provincial imitators are just straws that show the way of the wind when these persons say we will do such and such things in contravention of the law there is practically nothing to stop them in the same way when a community determines to run amuck on an occasion of national rejoicing such as the late maffa king night or because a strike is in progress or a charity dinner has been badly served or the vaccination laws are being enforced it does so at its own sweet will and order can be hanged once a week too namely on saturday nights english order like the free list at the theatres is entirely suspended saturday night is the recognized and inviolable hour of the mob throughout the country your flaring english gin palaces are at their flaringest the beer pumps sing together with a myriad voices and the clink of glasses takes the evening air with beauty until perhaps eight o'clock all goes well then the quarrelsomeness which the english masses extract from their cups begins to assert itself and the chuckers out in what other country in the world are their chuckers out and the police begin to be busy till long after midnight their hands are full and it is not until the sabbath is a couple of hours old that the english masses seek their rest in the meantime what squalid indiscretions what sins against humanity what outrages have not been committed the bare consumption of drink alone has been appalling the bickerings angry shoutings indulgences in pugilism and hair-pulling have been infinite and on monday morning the police courts will have their usual plethora of drunks and disorderlies wife-beatings and assaults on the police 
with perhaps a case or two of manslaughter and a murder to put the crown on things in the main however law and order may be counted among john bull's many illusions they are as one might say sweet to meditate upon they look all right on paper and they sound all right in the mouths of orators for the rest the englishman who is wise smiles and keeps a folded tail one may note before leaving this entertaining subject that in england lawyers and laymen alike take a special pride in admitting a certain ignorance at the bare mention of scots law they lift up pious hands and impious eyes and say thank heaven we know nothing about it chapter eighteen education lord rosebery whom the worthy mr crossland dislikes on purely racial grounds is usually credited as the originator of what has latterly become the englishman's watchword educate 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 whether it was the scotch half of lord rosebery or the english half that prompted him to this simple human cry i shall not pretend to say on the other hand it is certain that when his lordship offered the english such a profound piece of advice he gave them exactly the counsel that they most needed for though the english boast of their knowledge though they are the arrogant possessors of seats of learning out of which can come nothing but perfection though they possess ancient universities and ancient public schools though they have a school board system and free education and though their country is overrun with middle-sized men who play billiards and drink bitter beer and call themselves schoolmasters they are indubitably and unmistakably an uneducated people until the passing of the elementary education act of eighteen seventy learning in england amounted practically to a luxury only the rich might be permitted to know things it was a case of schools colleges and universities for the sons of noblemen and gentlemen the rascally lower classes might look after themselves it is open to question whether the rascally lower classes were not on the whole educationally better off in that day than they are at present that however is by the way but in the later sixties the reformer got his eagle eye on the rascally lower classes he perceived that the rascally lower classes were in bad case they got drunk they used foul language they smoked short pipes and heaven help them they could not read anticipating the english or scotch half of lord rosbery as the case may be the reformer said educate 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 and so it was the english have been educating ever since they educated to such purpose that thirty years later lord rosebery felt it incumbent upon himself to bid them educate 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 in those thirty years the rascally lower classes learned somewhat they were supposed to discover inter alia that knowledge was power they were told that a hodman who could write his name was a better hodman than the hodman whose sign manual was a cross they were led shrewdly to infer that their pastors and masters and general betters owed their supremacy to knowledge and that if they the rascally lower classes would only instruct their children these same children might wax great in the land and carry burdens no more the rascally lower classes sent their children to school some of them cheerfully some of them with groans and the stars began to shine over england's darkness what has come to pass all men know every englishman gets the smatterings of a literary education and believes in his heart that he was cut out by the almighty to be a clerk the honest trades and handicrafts are no longer desirable in the minds of english youth to take one's coat off with a view to livelihood is a business for dolts and fools advertise in england for an office boy and you shall receive five hundred applications advertise for a boy to learn plumbing and you will be offered perhaps two daft-looking lads who after much thrashing have managed to attain the age of fourteen years the fact is that the english do not know what education means at the public schools and at the universities of oxford and cambridge education has become to a great extent a social matter 
you go to these places to learn certainly but you also go with a view to the formation of a desirable and influential acquaintance and to get upon your forehead the mark which is supposed to make glorious the public school and university bred englishman as a general rule that mark is altogether imperceptible to the eyes of the unelect who if the truth must be told discover the university man not so much by his manners or conversation as by his ineptitudes when one comes to consider the principles upon which the public school and university system are worked one is quite prepared to admit that were it not for the element of snobbery patent in the system english public schools and universities alike would in the long run have to be disestablished as it is they are the conventional resort of aristocratic adolescence and permitted to exist only on condition that if a low middle-class person can find the money and keep up the style he too may join the angelic host to the man of temperament to the scholar to the man who loves learning for learning's sake the english universities have precious little to offer after oxford and cambridge one turns to london and the non-resident foundations all of them i believe modern here as it seems to me the english err again broadly speaking these institutions wittingly or unwittingly devote their energies to the preparation of young men for the civil service if you are an english board school teacher at eighty pounds a year and you discover that a second-class clerk in the circumlocution department commences at three hundred pounds a year and that roughly the examination to be passed is the same as for matriculation at london you naturally go in bald-headed for matriculation at london for the learning you get by these efforts you have not the smallest respect if on presenting yourself for examination by the civil service commissioners you come out sufficiently high on the list to secure an appointment well and good if not your labor has been wasted it is this spirit which is at the bottom of the english ignorance with them learning education is a means to an end and not in the least its own exceeding great reward hence a properly educated englishman is almost as rare as a blue rose for the masses the rascally lower classes that is to say there are the board schools here for thirty years past has been enacted about the sweetest travesty of education that the mind of man could conceive for the teaching of the children of the rascally lower orders the wise english government with the assistance of the wise english school boards has invented what is to all intents and purposes a new type of man and his name shall be called schoolmaster he began heaven knows how but if you inquire into him you will find that he has spent three years at a government training college and that prior to this experience he was for some years a pupil teacher also that he is a son of the people and that his father drove an engine or kept a shop in these latter circumstances he was perhaps fortunate the marvellous fact about him is that in spite of his years of pupil teachership and of his three years at a government training college he is not a man of either learning or culture i am told that an english pupil teacher is not expected to fash himself by the study of either latin or greek two books of euclid will see him through the stiffest of his examinations he does not need to have even a nodding acquaintance with modern languages and as for science if he really wants some he must pick it up at evening classes even when he passes into the government training college where by the way he is instructed and boarded and lodged gratis his studies do not become in any way profound the history of england the geography of the world arithmetic according to barnard smith algebra according to dr todhunter latin and greek according to dr william smith part one with a little french a very little french bring him to the end of his tether really the whole business is childish any youth of average capacity should get through the entire three years course in six weeks of course there is the so-called technical training to reckon with that is to say a man at one of these colleges is supposed to spend a great deal of his time and no doubt does in perfecting himself as a teacher 
but one would have thought that actual practice in an ordinary school would be the best instructor in this respect in any case nobody can consider closely the english schoolmaster as manufactured at government training colleges without perceiving that the government turns out a very remarkable article indeed i have no desire to belittle a hard-worked and probably underpaid body of public servants their profession is a thankless one i do not think for a moment a single man of them went into it with his eyes open and i know for a certainty that the school boards and the government between them have so hedged it round with petty annoyances that a man possessed of feeling must loathe it it is probably this feeling of loathing of his work that keeps the english schoolmaster down he knows that it is vain for him to go a hair's breadth out of the beaten tracks the school boards must have grants the government inspectors must be satisfied there is only one method of ensuring these desirable consummations that one way amounts to sheer mechanism and slog the english schoolmaster must have no temperament if he possesses such a thing he is bound to come to great grief hence the whole weight of the english system is from first to last employed in the work of knocking temperament out of him and keeping it out his three years free training particularly tend to make a slack unthinking sap head of him he gets a parchment which entitles him to call himself a certificated teacher and he is taught to imagine that for downright learning there is nothing like himself under the sun in this latter surmise he is quite right the schoolmaster in england though he will probably be another quarter of a century waking up to the fact counts for next to nothing men of parts avoid him men of no parts laugh at him for himself i imagine he will long continue to believe in his heart that he is a great man a little lower perhaps than a parson but certainly a little higher than a policeman the real value of english education like the real value of most other things becomes apparent when it is put to the test of practical affairs any employer of labor will tell you that whether an english boy come to him from a school board or a school of a higher grade whether he be the son of a ploughman or of what the english call a professional man he is always and inevitably a good deal of a fool you have to teach him how to lick stamps you have to teach him that excepting in so far as he can write and read what he has learned at school is not wanted you have to teach him how many beans make five you have to teach him that punctuality and accuracy are worth more in business than all the botany he ever learned and all the time you have to watch him like a cat watching a mouse fire out the fools once exclaimed dr robertson nicoll i do not think it is too much to say that if the average english employer took the hint he would have nobody left to do his business for him End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen recreation to amuse oneself is the great art of life from the english point of view the finest kind of amusement is to be obtained by killing something fox hunting deer stalking grouse shooting pheasant shooting pigeon shooting and even rabbit shooting still stand for a great deal among the best class of englishmen of old the masses had their bull baitings dog fights and cock fights these however are no longer regarded as legitimate forms of amusement and the masses being for various reasons unable to hunt foxes and shoot peasants have to fall back on recreations in which killing takes place only by accident there is the race course and the football field the masses are expected to consider themselves happy outside racing and football however the come day go day englishman has a good many facilities for recreation although in most communities the grandfatherly authorities have abolished the old feasts and fairs which provided periodic saturnalia of merry-go-rounds and wild beast shows it is a poor townlet which cannot nowadays boast its permanent settlement of coconut shies and shooting galleries where on saturday evenings the true-born englishman may find substantial joys 
then for the londoner in addition to this kind of thing there are from time to time provided vast orgies at hampstead heath the welsh harp barnet fair and other choice resorts here again it is a case of coconuts and shooting galleries swing boats steam roundabouts and aerial flights backed up with donkey rides a free use of the tickler and the ladies teaser unlimited confetti throwing and unlimited beer these amusements of course are on the face of them quite innocent and equally english and unintellectual failing merry-go-rounds and coconut shies the delights of which are apt to pall the english masses have still left to them their main redoubt of rational enjoyment which for reasons no man may skill is called the music hall the english music hall is practically an expansion or efflorescence of the old-fashioned sing-song sixty years ago the man who went out to take a stoop of ale at his inn was accustomed to be regaled with a little music free of charge mine host had possessed himself of a second-hand piano and secured the services of some broken-down musician to play it for him there was a great singing of old songs and the time sped merrily as it did in the golden age these feasts of harmony brought custom and in course of time the evening sing-songs at certain hostelries became organized institutions and were run on lines of great enterprise the piano being supplemented by an orchestra and the pianist by a number of professional singers and entertainers within the last fifty years the sing-song has been separated from its parent the alehouse and has developed into the music hall Today the English music halls are almost as thick on the ground as churches and chapels. In the metropolis you would have a difficulty to count them. In the provinces every town of size supports two or three halls and insists on London talent and London style. The class of entertainment provided may be costly and amusing, but it is certainly not edifying. The performers, almost to a man, and one might say to a woman, are persons who can be considered artists only in the broadest sense, and whose ignorance and vulgarity are as colossal as their salaries. Roughly, the entertainment may be divided into two sections, the one concerned with feats of strength, juggling, and the like, and the other with laughter-making and vocalism as regards the first of these sections a man who can balance a horse and trap on the end of his chin appears to give great satisfaction to an english audience why this should be so nobody knows the good purpose that may be served by balancing a horse and trap on the end of one's chin is not obvious but the english masses are ravished by the spectacle they also have a great fondness for the stout lady who catches cannon-balls on the back of her neck for the other stout lady who risks her life nightly on the flying trapeze for the gentleman who walks about the stage with a piano under one arm and a live mule under the other and for the gentleman who rides the bicycle standing on his head to the mind of the english masses these are marvels and well worth the money they give a zest to life and they provide material for conversation and their attraction seems perennial the great standby of the halls however is the laughter-making and vocal department here shine the great stars whose names are familiar on english lips as household words here is pervade the culture the song and the humour of the english masses it is from the music hall stage that the vast majority of englishmen take their tone and their sentiment that renowned comedian fred fetchem strolls on to the boards of the frivolity some night and assuming a fiendish grin exclaims idiotically that's air next morning and for many weeks thereafter all england says there's air on any and every occasion what oh she bumps now why shan't be long not half did he and similar catchwords all popular and all meaningless capture the english imagination in their turn and for a season at any rate englishmen can say nothing else it is the same with the music hall song always there are current in england three or four songs of the hour which every englishman worth the name sings whistles or hums and always these songs from whatever point of view regarded are of the most blithering and bathotic nature at the present moment the prime and universal favorite is that pathetic ditty everybody's loved by someone 
for the benefit of the english i quote the first stanza and the chorus of this work a lady stood within a busy city, her darling little daughter by her side. She'd stopped to buy a bunch of pretty violets from a ragged little orphan she espied. The words she spoke were kinder than the boy had heard for years, and in reply to what she asked, he murmured through his tears, "'Everybody's loved by someone. Everybody knows that's true. Some have father and mother, dear, sister and brother, too.' all the time that i remember since i was a mite so small i seem to be the only one that nobody loves at all with this enchanting song the english welkin resounds by day and night the great broad-shouldered genial englishman full of four ale and bad whisky howls it in chorus at his favorite public work girls sing it in factories mothers rock their children to sleep with it and every english urchin whistles or shouts it at you with unflagging zest of course there are others for example there is i'm a policeman which goes like this in the inky hour of midnight when the clock is striking three as i stroll along my beet route many curious things i see Ragged urchins stagger past me to their mansions in the West. Millionaires, through cold and hunger, on our doorsteps sink to rest. Dirty dustmen in their broughams, off to supper at the cry. Then Bill Sykes the burglar passes, with an eyeglass in his eye. Such are the sights I witness when I am on my beat, filling my heart with sawdust, filling my boots with feet. Covering half the pavement up with my plates of meat, though mother sent to say that i'm a policeman which uh, need one remark is intended for what the scots are supposed to call wut also there is he stopped pendleberry plum had a wart on his gum and he rubbed it with sandpaper hard the wart on his gum made plum fairly hum when it stuck out about half a yard the wart grew so quick when he rubbed it with a brick till it looked like a short billiard cue said plum to himself i shall die on the shelf for i'm darned if i know what to do so he went and got a pickaxe and shoved it underneath then he lifted up his jaw and he swallowed all his teeth and then he stopped the verses i have quoted are a good true and fair sample of the kind of thing that finds favor among the english masses i do not think that anything better is being proffered and it is pretty certain that anything less inane would be doomed to failure the fact is that the english mind in the lump is flat coarse and maggoty and the english understanding is as the understanding of a feeble and ill-bred child a couple of generations ago the songs popular among englishmen had some claim to coherence decency and common sense nowadays however the englishman admits that he cannot sing the old songs he has gone farther and fared worse and among the many symptoms of his decadence none is more pronounced than his easy toleration of the balderdash that is being served up to him by the alls chapter twenty stock exchange there is nothing in england more astounding or more tigerish than the city man englishmen have a fixed idea that they are the soul of generosity indifferent to money and not in the least sordid when they are put to it for a type of sheer greediness it pleases them to point a finger at the scot yet there can be no doubt that of late years the desire for riches has become the absorbing english passion the ostentation and vulgar displays of the aristocracy and the newly rich have stirred the middle-class english heart to envy how comes it that such and such a man sleeps on lilies and eats roses he has means my friend and what are means just money if you are going to be happy in this life if you insist upon a full paunch of the choicest upon the ease and softness which are so grateful to decadent persons if you would be in a position to possess all that the soul of the decadent person covets you really must have money and as you are a middle-class englishman whose people have omitted to leave you a million or so it is very awkward for you life is short the cup goes round but once you have five hundred pounds 
how is it to be made into fifty thousand pounds and that while the flush of youth still incarnadines your ambitious cheek there is only one way you must speculate judiciously if you can but you must speculate you are an englishman and a sportsman and sometimes you get your fifty thousand pounds then all the world marvels and would fain do likewise so that the ball is kept rolling it is a ball full of money and it rolls cityward the generous open-handed englishmen who are the city take as much as they want and toss you the balance the game is as fashionable as ping-pong everybody plays it and win or lose everybody calls it the stock exchange i am told that the stock exchange proper is a reputable institution and essential to the well-being of the country i do not doubt this for a moment but round it there has grown up a specious and parasitical finance which is rapidly transforming the english into a nation of punters fortunes made while you wait is the lure to which the latter-day englishman has been found infallibly to respond the remnant of the common sense possessed by his excellent grandparents arouses in him a sneaking suspicion that the golden promises of the outside broker and the bucket shopkeeper are not to be depended upon yet he reads in his morning paper that no end of stocks and shares have risen a point or dropped a point as the case may be and he knows that if he had been in on the right side he would have made more money in a few hours than his excellent grandparents would have made in the course of a whole grubby lifetime hence sooner or later his patrimony or few hundred of surplus capital is planked into the ball that rolls citywards on the off chance that it may come back arm in arm as it were with thousands even the more cautious sort of englishman who looks upon speculation with a deprecating eye and pins his faith on legitimate investment is rapidly descending into the gambling habit schemes which promise fat dividends inflame his imagination and drag him out of the even tenor of his way he is perfectly well aware that fifteen twenty and twenty five per cent in return for one's money is quite wrong somehow but on the other hand the prospect ravishes and there are concerns in the world which pay such dividends year by year without turning a hair only sometimes there is a colossal smash and half the shopkeepers of england put on sackcloth and ashes and get up funds for one another's relief to the looker-on the whole system is highly diverting to the players in the game the fun will never be obvious the real truth about the matter is simply this the standard of living in england is an inflated and artificial standard practically every englishman lives or longs to live beyond his means the workman and the workman's wife must put on the style of the foreman and the foreman's wife and the foreman and the foreman's wife must appear to be nearly as comfortably off as the manager the manager as his employer all employers shopkeepers factory owners ironmasters engineers printers and even publishers as prosperous as each other and so on till you come to dukes than whom of course nobody can be more prosperous it would be possible to bring together six englishmen whose incomes ranged from one pound ten shilling a week to fifty pounds a year and whose dress and taste would be pretty well identical fifty years ago the sons of the middle classes had really no inclination toward the superfluities the dandy was rather laughed at among them the gourmet was a monster they never by any chance encountered and the libertine was a sad warning and a person to be eschewed nowadays it is all the other way the gilt and tinsel and glamour and rapidity of the gay world have captured the english understanding and brought it exceedingly low there is little moral backbone left in the country money 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 to be ill-gotten and ill-spent is the english ideal the man who can go without is considered a crank or a fool or worse or he is set down for an indolent fellow who should be given a month or two on the treadmill for luck the whole duty of man of englishmen that is to say is to have money in ponderable quantities the man without it is of no account at all nobody believes in him nobody wants him nobody tolerates him he may be wise and witty and chaste and blessed with all the virtues and still be received with great coldness by bank managers 
and it is well known that the attitude of a bank manager towards a man is the attitude of society at large if the bank manager beams and rubs his hand god's in his heaven all's right with the world if the bank manager frowns and sends you impertinent letters you may last a week or a fortnight or a few months but you are on thin ice and you must please take care not to forget it i should not be at all surprised if the omnipotent official whose business it is to discover what persons are or are not qualified to approach our british fountain of honour were one day found to be a bank manager in disguise so that on the whole the englishman has every inducement to get rich and to be very quick about it his dealings with the stock exchange that is to say with the city are but the natural expression of his anxiety to oblige all parties concerned it is a pity that getting and spending should become the main concerns of his life but as he pathetically puts it one must do as rome does and some women are never content the stock exchange is the only way chapter twenty one the beloved what is more beautiful or meet to be taken to the bosom than the englishman everybody loves him his goings to and fro upon the earth are as the progresses of one who has done all men good he drops fatness and blessings as he walks he smiles benignity and graciousness and i am glad to see you all looking so well and before him runs one in plush crying who is the most popular man of this footstool and all the people shall rejoice and say the englishman god bless him hence it comes to pass that in whatever part of the world the englishman may find himself he has a feeling that he is thoroughly at home i am as welcome as flowers in may he says those poor foreigners those poor heathen are glad to see me they never have any money poor devils and were it not for our whirring spindles at home i verily believe they would have nothing to wear in the brief the englishman abroad is always in a sort of father christmassy santa claus frame of mind he eats well he drinks well and he sleeps well he calls for the best and he pays for it it is a wonderful thing to do and it goes straight to the hearts of the poor foreigner and the poor heathen this at any rate is the englishman's own view it is a pleasing consoling and stimulating view and it would ill become an unregenerate outsider rudely to disturb it indeed i question whether the englishman in his blindness and adipose conceit would allow you to disturb it when persons in france say a bas l'anglais your fat englishman smiles and says little boys when people put rude pictures of him on german postcards he smiles again and says that the flowing tide of public opinion in germany is entirely with him when dutch farmers propose to throw him into the sea he becomes very red in the neck splutters somewhat and says i'm sure they will make excellent subjects in time and when the savage americans desire to chaw him up and swallow him he says you astonish me i have always been under the impression that blood was thicker than water his desire is to live at peace with all men but his notion of peace is to have his hand in both your pockets and no questions asked he owns two-thirds of the habitable globe vide the geography books and every pint of sea is his pace the popular song he owns also everything that is worth owning he is the pierpont morgan of the universe who could help loving him on the other hand the excellent j b has not escaped calumny if i were disposed to reproduce some of the slanders upon him it goes without saying that they would make a rather large chapter all manner of foreign writers have time and time again had a fling at the englishman they love him but their love is not blind they perceive that he has faults of a grievous nature and they write accordingly curiously enough too quite severe criticisms of john bull have been written in his own household mr wilfred scowen blunt for example who is an englishman and apparently innocent of celtic taint actually goes so far as to call the englishman an anglo-norman dog down to the latest born the hungriest of the pack the master wolf of all men called the sassenach the anglo-norman dog who goeth by land and sea 
as his forefathers went in chartered piracy death fire in his right hand and the english poet goes on to elaborate his indictment against the englishman thus he hath outlived the day of the old single graspings where each went his way alone to plunder all he hath learned to curb his lust somewhat to smooth his brawls to guide his passionate gusts his cry of mine 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 in inarticulate wrath he dareth not make raid on goods his next friend hath with open violence nor lose his hand to steal save in community and for the common weal twixt saxon man and man he is more congruous grown holding a subtler plan to make the world his own by organized self-seeking in the paths of power he is new drill to wait he knoweth his appointed hour and his appointed prey of all he maketh tool even of his own sad virtues to cajole and rule we are told further that the beloved has tarred time's features pockmarked nature's face and brought all to the same jakes whatever that may mean also there is no sentient thing polluteth and defileth as this saxon king this intellectual lord and sage of the new quest the only wanton he that fouleth his own nest and still his boast goeth forth this is an english opinion and consequently worth the money mr blunt assures us that in putting it forth he has the approval of no less a philosopher than mr herbert spencer and no less an idealist than mr george frederick watts i have not says mr blunt shrunk from insisting on the truth that the hypocrisy and all-acquiring greed of modern england is an atrocious spectacle one which if there be any justice in heaven must bring a curse from god as it has surely already made the angels weep the destruction of beauty in the name of science the destruction of happiness in the name of progress the destruction of reverence in the name of religion these are the pharisaic crimes of all the white races but there is something in the anglo-saxon impiety crueler still that it also destroys as no other race does for its mere vainglorious pleasure the anglo-saxon alone has in our day exterminated root and branch whole tribes of mankind he alone has depopulated continents species after species of their wonderful animal life and is still yearly destroying and this not merely to occupy the land for it lies in large part empty but for his insatiable lust of violent adventure to make record bags and kill when the beloved comes across reading of this sort he no doubt sheds bitter tears and remembers how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child and he goes on his way rejoicing unimpressed and unreformed the fact of the matter is that from the beginning john bull though possessed of a great reputation for honesty and munificence has never really been any better than he should be when he interfered between tyrant and slave when he went forth to conquer savage persons and to annex savage lands which somehow invariably flowed with milk and honey he made a point of doing it with the air of a philanthropist and for centuries the whole world took him at his own estimate even in the late war the great cry was that he did not want gold mines as a general rule he never wants anything but he always gets it it is only of late that the world has begun to find him out and that he himself has begun to have qualms he feels in his bones that something has gone wrong with him it may be a slight matter and not beyond repair but there it is he cannot put his hand on his heart and say i am the fine substantial sturdy truth-speaking incorruptible magnanimous genial englishman of half a century ago the fly has crept into the ointment of his virtue and the fragrance of it no longer remains his attitude at the present moment is the attitude of the anxious man who perceives that life is a little too much for him and keeps on saying we shall have to buck up he is in two minds about most things over which he was once cocksure he could not quite tell you for example whether he continues to stand at the head of the world's commerce or not once there was no doubt about it now well it is a question of statistics and you can prove anything by statistics out of america men have come to buy english things which were deemed unpurchasable the american has come and seen and purchased and done it quite quickly 
the englishman is a little puzzled his slow wits cannot altogether grasp the situation we must buck up he says and take measures while there is still time he does not see that the new order is upon him and that inevitably and for his good he must be considerably shaken up his own day has been a lengthy a roseful and a gaudy one it has been a day of ease and triumph and comfortable going and the beloved has become very wealthy and a trifle stout in consequence whether to-morrow is going to be his day too and whether it is going to be one of those nice loafing sunshiny kind of days that the beloved likes are open questions it is to be hoped devoutly that fate will be kind to him he needs the sympathy of all who are about him he wants encouragement and support and a restful time it is said that his majesty of portugal who has just left these shores on being asked what had impressed him most during his visit replied the roast beef nothing else sir inquired his interlocutor yes said the monarch the boiled beef and there is a great deal in it through much devouring of beef the english have undoubtedly waxed a trifle beefy it is their beefiness and suetness that fatty degeneration in fact which impresses you recognizing his need of props and stays and abdominal belts as it were the beloved has latterly taken to remembering the colonies he is now of opinion that he and his sturdy children overseas should be knit together in bonds of closer unity to present an unbroken front to the world should share the burdens and glories of empire and so on and so forth the colonies good bodies saw it all at once they had been accustomed to be snubbed and neglected and left out of count and they had forgotten to whom they belonged in his hour of need the beloved cried help i said i didn't want you but i do i do and the colonies went to his aid at a dollar a day per head the prettiest lot of freebooters and undesirable characters they found themselves able to muster later they sent several landau loads of premiers and politicians who were fed and flattered to their hearts content and went home no doubt greatly impressed with the english roast and boiled beef these gentlemen made speeches in return for their dinners they were allowed to visit the colonial office and kiss the hand of mr chamberlain they saw peter robinson's and the tuppany tube and the bonds of empire have been knit closer ever since not to put too fine a point upon it the englishman's attempt to buttress himself up out of the colonies has proved a ghastly failure the scheme fell flat the english may want the colonies but the colonies do not want the english at any rate on bonds of unity lines the banner of imperialism which has waved so gloriously during the past lustrum will have to be furled and put away the great imperial idea declines to work it has been brought on the political stage half a century too late at best it was a fetch and it has failed the all-beloved will have to find some other way out whether he is quite equal to the task may be reckoned another question one supposes that he will try for there is life in the old dog yet at any rate according to the old dog end of chapter twenty one End of The Egregious English by T. W. H. Crossland